Um, I think that we have everybody that is scheduled to be here on time, so that's excellent. So I will call this meeting to order. We'll start with a moment of silence. Okay, and the flag salute, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of, the of the United States, States of America and to, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice for all. And roll call. Vicky's on mute. <laughs> Mr. Caliguar. Ms. Darmo. Here. Mr. Dovey. Mr. Dovey. Okay, same. Uh, Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Present. Mr. Phil Jenkins. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Cameron Ugian. Yes. Mr. Litwack. Here. Mr. McLaughlin. Here. And Ms. Tercis Keeley. A uh, reading of statement of adequate notice, please. Notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given as follows. Advertising in the Burlington County Times and the Carrier Post on January 14th, 2021. Posting on school bulletin boards and main entrance doors on March 4th, 2021. Sending a notice to the Burlington County Times and the Carrier Post on March 3rd, 2021 filing written notice with the clerk of Delanco Township on March 3rd, 2021, and posting the notice electronically on the district website, www.delanco.com on March 3rd, 2021. Okay, thank you. And now we will start the board member training with NJSBA representative, Jesse Adams. The floor is all yours. All right, thank you. And good evening, everyone. Um, I did send out some handouts and I know that uh, your superintendent got them to you. Let me uh share my screen here real quick up oh, i'm i need sharing uh, privileges please albert are you able to okay i think you might have the ability now all right there we go um let's see where's all of the other windows all right so let's what i want to do is i just touch on real quick about the uh, the handouts that I sent you. Uh, I believe there were five of them. So I just wanna quickly walk through them so that you know what they are. One one of them is uh, the, the code of ethics. Uh, it's the same handout that you should have gotten when we did our ethics training, but, uh, but we're talking goals. I mean, we're talking uh, roles, responsibilities. That's, that's what the foundations of board governance is. So we include this as a handout because it's all tied to the School Ethics Act, as well as the Code of, Code of, Code of Ethics. Um, we also included a, one of our publications. It's a pamphlet that, uh, that's available. It's, it's given out uh, at different training programs. It's, it's one, of the, one of the places it's given out is new board member orientation. Um, and it's what does, who does what in public school governance. Very good pamphlet. Um, you uh, recommend you read it. It outlines roles and responsibilities, you know, as it relates to board members and the superintendent. Um, I also included uh, a one charter. This 2020, it's actually a 2019 SEC uh, um, commissioner case. We covered this in the um, ethics training, but I pulled this out to include because it is a social media uh, case uh, that a member was suspended for six months for their social media activity. So I just provide that as a reminder um, and that, that you need to be careful in that arena. Um, then I also included uh, this document called what the board should know about personnel. And we'll be talking about that later in the program. And then I also provided you a separate handout on setting the stage which is in the presentation. I'll talk to it, but I like to give this as a separate handout to boards, um, basically, so they have it uh, readily available uh, as a tool for their, for their board business. So let me go to the presentation. Share this slideshow. 
Uh, hopefully everybody can see the openings cover slide there. So let's get rolling. Um, so let's talk about the difference between the roles of, of, of the role of the superintendent and the board. So here's a basic question. How many board members does it take to change a light bulb? Nine. Uh, Larry says nine. Does anybody nine disagree five. with that? What's five. that? Five. Nine or okay. Five. Well, Harry's throwing up multiple answers, right? Yeah. Nine or five. It's, it's, it's I think that's algebraic I, subset of five through nine. Zero. I would say zero. That's not our job. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. The answer is zero. None. It's up to the board to say, let there be light. Once they've made that determination of what they want, light, it's up to the superintendent to decide what kind of light you're going to have, right? Is it going to be candlelight, neon, solar, incandescent? Superintendent makes that decision. That's part of the administrative responsibility. Brings that recommendation back to the board, and then it's up to the board to approve the purchase of the lights. And then superintendent makes sure they get installed. And then once they're installed, the board evaluates the quality of the light. We said, let there be light. Did the superintendent and the administration meet the intent of the requirement that we laid out there? That's the evaluation. So that's a very oversimplified example of the difference between the board's role and the superintendent's role. So let's talk about the four functions of the Board of Education. I mentioned this in the ethics training because it, it, it comes out of the code of ethics, but there are four functions of a board of education, policy, planning, oversight and appraisal, and two-way communication. Policy, you are a policy-making body. We talk about the what and the how, and we'll, we'll touch on that here in a couple minutes, but you determine and tell your district what you want for the community, for the district uh, as a whole through your policies. So policy can be sometimes a boring part of your responsibility. I know some there are some people who love to be on the policy committee because that's, th that's their thing. But it is one of the most important responsibilities you have as a board. Your policies that are what you want as a board for your district. The superintendent's responsibility is to implement those policies. And through implementation, superintendent may have to develop regulations, may have to develop procedures, may have to develop operating processes in order to meet the intent and implement and, and appropriately implement uh, the policy. So you should take your policy making responsibility extremely seriously. Your second responsibility is planning. And what do I mean by planning? Every year you're required to establish the district goals. That's part of your, replan your planning responsibility. What are you going to focus on in the next year? You need to plan for that. What are your board goals? If you establish board goals, that's part of your planning responsibilities. If the board, if the board has a strategic plan or develops a strategic plan, that's part of your responsibility as a board. Plan budget. The budget process, budget planning is the board's responsibility. You don't, you don't actually create that budget. Your BA and your superintendent do the, the roll up the sleeves, what I call the real grunt work, putting that budget together. But the budget process is your planning responsibility. You're responsible for getting a budget that ends up being approved by the board to run the school year for the next year. Your superintendent and your BA are the ones who facilitate and develop and put those budgets together. They brief you, they discuss those with you. You, you um, through those discussions, you modify, but that's all part of your planning responsibility. So, so you have a major role and it is your, one of your more, one of your four main roles is planning for the future of your district. Your third function is oversight and appraisal. Um, and what do I mean by that? You have oversight of the district. 
if you remember from the code of ethics, that with the, the tenant says that you're not there to administer, but with, with you be, between you and your fellow board members, you have to ensure that the district is being well run. That's an oversight role. You don't run the day to day. You don't do the administration. You don't, you know, you don't pick what kind of light bulbs you are going to go in into the district once you've determined that you want light. That's, you know, you set the set the oversight responsibility and you assess, did we get what we asked for? You also have appraisal responsibility. The district, um, from a district overall perspective, the superintendent has a, re a legal requirement to provide every employee in the district with a performance appraisal annually. Um, you as a board, you have responsibility for providing a performance appraisal for one, one employee, the one, the one employee that you're responsible for, the superintendent, all right? So, so that's your oversight and appraisal responsibilities. And then the fourth function is two-way communications. You're required to get information out to all of your stakeholders and you should be bringing back the aspirations of your community as the elected officials. That's that two-way communication. I think we talked about this during the ethics, ethics training. You guys have, a, your district sends communications out all the time. And anything that comes from a teacher, the superintendent, the BA, going out is Board of Education communication. So you're fulfilling that, that outbound communication um, through all of the processes you have in your district. If you think you need to improve on them, you work with the superintendent to identify where there are areas for improvement. And then the superintendent implements those, those changes that everyone agrees on. But that's your outbound uh, communication. As you hear of the and learn of the aspirations of your district and your constituents, you should bring that back to your board, fellow board members and the superintendent so that you hopefully you're all staying on the same page of what the desires are of your con community, your community for the children of the district. Now, that is not the rumor mill. Okay, and I, I, I want to emphasize that it's not the rumor mill. And, and you're bringing every single rumor. It's what are the, the things that you can improve on in the district to help the children moving forward. So it's, and there is a definite difference between the rumor mill and, and things that are aspirational that can help the district move forward. So, so those are your four functions as a board. So let's talk about setting the stage. This is one, one of the um, handouts that I sent to you. We talk about two things when it comes to roles and responsibilities. We talk about the what and the how. Those two terms you should re you put to your memory, what and how. What is desired, what the district, you know, what the, the what for, for, for district purposes is what does the board want? You determine the what. How the what gets accomplished is the superintendent and his team's responsibility. You determine what you want, superintendent figures out how he makes that happen. All right, so that's the difference. And this chart, I tell board members, if you have a nice little board folder that you keep with you all the time and you bring to board meetings, this document should be one of the documents in your board folder. The, the top line, is the swim lane that belongs to the board. Uh, well, the, not the very top line, the second line then. The second line belongs to the board. That's your swim lane. It's understanding the what. Across the top, very top, you see um, two, four, six areas of governance. Within those areas of governance, what you see on the line that belongs to the board are, are, air, are items that fall into the category of the board's thought process, the board areas and questions that arrive that can arrive from board members. These are the areas that fall in that oversight arena. So for example, if I look at personnel, it says standards and expectations, personnel policies, equity, hiring, training, evaluation, retention, policies associated with that, 
bargaining, recognition, staff recognition, and ensuring communication. Those are areas that belong to you. That, that those, those are areas where you set the what, you know, what your desires are. If you look at the next row, which is the how, that's the superintendent and his team's swim lane. So if, say, taking that same governance column under personnel, if you look at under the how line, the administration line, you see hiring practices, interviews, recommend recommendations, staff development and assignments, staff development programs, supervision, evaluation, recommendations for retention and tenure. Those are the superintendents and his team's responsibilities. You don't make tenure recommendations. You don't uh, do staff development. You know, that's the administrative line there. So what I tell boards is, if you're in a board meeting and you're going through agenda items and it's in one of these areas, you know, planning, program, personnel, finance, and you find yourself asking questions that fall in that lower line, the how line, you're out of your swim lane. You're, you're now administering. Your questions are administering questions. You need to raise your game up back up to that upper level and frame your questions to be in that how arena. That's the difference between your role from an oversight perspective and the superintendent's role in a administration getting the job done uh, scenario. So use this as a tool to help you hopefully stay in your swim lane so that you're not falling into asking administrative administering questions where you become where you start to become micromanaging things that you should not be involved in because ultimately that ends up being a violation of the code of ethics and the school ethics act so use this as a tool to help you stay in your swim lane which will keep you out of trouble and like i said you'll avoid uh, a personal audience with the the uh, sec up in trenton right so let's talk about some scenarios and, and I'm going to go through 10 scenarios here and we're going to, you know, I'm going to ask you, you know, is this your role? And then and, and we'll see what, what your answers are. So the first scenario, the Our Town Board of Education has successfully passed its elementary school building referendum and construction on the school has begun. Dan Rollins, a board member, who in his private life runs a large construction company has begun visiting the construction site every day to speak with the construction manager and check on the progress of the project. Is this your role? Does anybody think it is your role? The answer is it is not your role. The board has Typically in a construction project, a referendum is approved, you have construct, you have the business administrator has that responsibility to manage the project. You, the board may have even hired a project manager, a company to be the project manager that the BA will work with and that project manager will keep, keep the construction on, to, on track. Dan Rollins has expertise, right? As a, because he has his own construction firm you know, he's got a lot of expertise, but he does not have the authority to go on site to check what's going on. That is a violation of the code. He's taking personal uh, private action that could compromise the board. How could it compromise the board? Here's a good example. He's on the site, on the job site. He's looking at something and he says, you know what? In my company, we wouldn't have done it that way. You know, and he tells the foreman, you know, we, you know, this, this should have been done, you know, this way. And here's the way, you know, you should do it. And he leaves. Construction manager says, okay, that was a board member. All right. So he, they redo the work to match the way the board member said that it should be done. BA, a couple of weeks later, the BA gets a bill for a change order for $100,000 because of the work they did 
because Dan told him this is the way he would do it in his company and that's what he would expect. So they said, okay, the board gave direction. We did the work. Here's the change order, pay us board. Big problem, right? So there's a perfect example of a board member overstepping his responsibility, doing something he shouldn't have done and taking private action that compromised the board and cost the taxpayers. Second scenario, in executive session, the majority of the board of education decides to support the superintendent's recommendation to fire its extremely popular football coach because of his recent unprofessional and unsportsmanlike behavior following a disappointing loss to a big rival. The next day, Ed Reed, a member of the board who strongly disagrees with the decision, calls his best friend, John, whose son is on the football team and tells him about the board's decision. Ed encourages John to bring the team and their parents to the next board meeting to try to get the board to change their mind. Is that appropriate? Is there anybody on the board who thinks it is appropriate? Don't be shy, speak up. <laughs> it is not appropriate, right? Number one, where did this conversation take place? In executive session. So it's confidential, right? And until the next agenda comes out with that most with that action on the agenda, it stays confidential, right? Until the meeting where that action item is going to show up on the agenda. So number one, Ed breached confidentiality. So there's there's a violation of the tenant, I think it's tenant G for confidentiality. Plus, he took private action. That do you think it's going to compromise the board? How many people do you think is going to be at that next meeting? You're going to, that board's going to have a packed house and everybody's going to come to the, for public comment at the podium to blast the board for the, for, you know, putting this kind of an action on and you got, and that board was going to catch a lot of grief and it's going to be a really bad night. So Ed basically has compromised the board, right? Put the board in a compromising position. So, Here's a perfect example of, of a situation that you know, no board wants to be in. Definitely inappropriate. Scenario three, at the beginning of the annual budgeting process, the Our Town Board of Education meets with the superintendent and the business administrator, and they discuss and set parameters for the budget. Is this your role? Yes. Who thinks, anybody think it is? I heard one yes. Yes. The actual, yep. Actually, it is, right? Part of your responsibility is the budget planning process. And one of the first things every board should do is sit down with the BA and the um, uh, superintendent and discuss what are the budget parameters that the board is looking at for this year. For example, the board, obviously, you can go up to a 2% um, um, increase. The board may say this year, we will, one of the parameters we want to set for the budget, we want no more than a 1.5% increase in the overall budget. That's a budget parameter. Have a conversation. But, you know, the idea is if the board, if board has some desires for that budget for the next fiscal year, that's the time to make those parameters, have that discussion and identify those parameters to the superintendent and the business administrator, because you don't want them to go off, do all the work it takes, and it's a lot of work to take to get to that first draft of the budget and bring it back to the board for the first budget work session and have the board at that time throw all these things that they were thinking about on the table. And now that now the BA and the superintendent have to go back to the drawing board to incorporate these, to, to incorporate these parameters in to see what the impact is. By having that discussion up, front, they understand what your parameters are. They will build a budget to meet those parameters. And oh, by the way, they will also be able to tell you if you go to, uh, for example, the example I used was a instead of a two percent increase in the in the uh, budget, no more than a one and a half percent. The superintendent will be able to tell you by doing that. Here's what was impacted. 
negative, well, here are the negative impacts of this parameter. And you now have a clear picture as a board to make a decision. Do you want to stick with that parameter or not? How does it negatively impact your ability to provide a thorough and efficient education to the students? So those are the things that you'll get feedback on. So yes, it is appropriate to, for the board to meet with the, with the superintendent administrator in your planning role to talk about parameters. The next one, Claire Murray, a member of the board, is in the produce section of the supermarket. When two of her neighbors come up to her and tell her that their daughters have told them that their third grade teacher, Mrs. Smith, spends part of every school day talking and texting on her cell phone while she is in her classroom with her students. To calm the, her, you know, the, her, her neighbors down, Claire promises to investigate the situation and make sure that it doesn't continue. Is that appropriate for Claire to have done and no. for Claire to have promised? No. Yep, she's taken, she's made personal promise, taken a, and basically a private action. These folks have a complaint. The last tenant of the code of ethics says, you can't do anything about that complaint as a board member or as a board until the administration has had a chance to look at it. So to promise that you're going to, as a board member, investigate it and, and make sure it doesn't continue is, 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 a, is not the right thing to say. The right thing should have been, let, and let me tell you how to use the chain of command and coach them on who to contact to address this concern. So definitely inappropriate to try and solve the action yourself definite violation of tenant, um, the, uh, tenant J of the code of ethics and will definitely get you in trouble. Next uh, 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 scenario five, the board of education holds its meetings on the first and third um, Tuesday of the month. Board members receive their board packets on the Friday preceding the meetings. Bob Martin, a member of the board, in reading his packet over the weekend reveals, but uh, believes that he has found an error in one of the proposals that the board is, is supposed to vote on Tuesday evening. To make sure that everyone on the board is involved, he decides to wait until the meeting to point out the error and ask for clarification. Is that inappropriate uh, for a board member to do? Is that part of your role as a board member? Not I see, I see, I see folks shaking their heads. No, yeah. um, he, he should one, let, he should let somebody know, but not at the meeting. He should let them know as soon as he sees it. Exactly. This is, this is part of the board dynamics. This is part of board teamwork, right? You see something, you should bring it to the attention of the superintendent or the business administrator. They can look into it. And if there is an error, then the, the uh, superintendent BA can send an, an email out to the full board saying, hey, on this proposal, there was an error. The corrected information is attached. Now everybody has the same information. They have the correct information and, and the board can now move on Tuesday to take action. By, if, the, if, if the member had waited until that board meeting, number one, it might've looked like an, uh, I gotcha moment for you know that the board members putting the superintendent and the BA on report because there's something wrong. Um, so that's perceived as an I gotcha. But also if it is, if there is an error or something's wrong, and this is an important proposal that you nearly you can't and now you can't take action on it. You got to table it and, and you know postpone it to another meeting. It, or you may have to call a special meeting to, to act on this because you've got to get the correct information. That action is now delayed something that might be very important for the district. So this is one of those teamwork items. Do you know something? Bring it to the attention of the superintendent or the business administrator. They will look into it and they will correct it and make sure that correction gets out to the rest of the board so that, so that everything can move smoothly at your board meeting. Number six, Lisa Watson, a board member of, uh, on the, on the R-Town board has received multiple calls complaining about the behavior of a teacher at the middle school. Although she refers each of the callers up the chain of command, she also calls the superintendent to alert him of the issue. Is that appropriate? 
I see a lot of people shaking their head. Yes. Yeah. That's one of those. The person did exactly what they should have done. They, they coached the uh, person to use the chain of command, told them, probably told them what policy to follow and, and uh, help them tell them in the name of the person they should call. So they helped them use the chain of command. Then they picked up the phone and gave a heads up to the superintendent. Hey, not sure if it'll get to your level. I told so-and-so had this problem. I referred her to the principal or the supervisor, but just wanted to give you a heads up in case it works its way up to your level. And typically the superintendent will contact the, the principal and say, hey, just a heads up, you may be getting a call from a parent about a problem. You know, board member referred them to the chain of command. So just a heads up. That's appropriate, very appropriate. That's part of the board team process, right? That's good board team teamwork. Okay. Number seven, the elementary, the R-Town Elementary School needs a new assistant principal. Because the superintendent is new, the board decides they're going to read all of the applications and do the interviewing of all of the candidates for the position. Is that appropriate? No. No. The only interview process that you have responsibility for as a board is the superintendent when you're hiring a superintendent. All other hiring activities belong to the superintendent and is the superintendent's responsibility. Um, the board is definitely out of their swim lane by taking that, by insisting on taking that responsibility. Number eight, a board member, Elizabeth Gonzalez, a board member on the board is very concerned about the district math scores. She's heard a lot of talk about a new miracle math program that's being advertised on television. She calls the superintendent and asks superintendent to research that math program, prepare a report comparing that program with the district's current math program and the math programs used in neighboring districts. Districts Is that appropriate? Nope. Nope, because one of the tenants says is that the authority rests in the board. So a couple of things here, this is private action being taken by uh, this board member, directing the superintendent to do something when individual board members have zero authority. Superintendent doesn't work for in a nine member board, doesn't work for nine bosses. Superintendent works for one boss, the board of education. Um, so in this case, you know, this is inappropriate for the person, you know, what there are, there are correct ways to handle something like that board member has an idea, wants, to, wants it to be looked into. There's a couple of ways to do it. One, if, if it's, a, this, this would be a curriculum item, right? So if you have a curriculum committee, board members should call the curriculum chair and say, hey, I saw this great math program. I'd like to ask the committee to look into this in, in your next committee meeting, add it to the agenda. Committee chair adds it to the agenda, superintendent, curriculum director are part of the committee meeting, they talk about it. And if there's research that needs to be done, the committee, committee turns the uh, superintendent on to getting that research done, brings it back to the committee, they talk about it. And if, there's, if it's worth it, they're gonna make a recommendation to the board. That's a clean way to get it done. Another way to do it, every board, I'm like, I can't say every board, but typically boards have a new business section on their agenda. If, if uh, a board member wants to bring up an idea like this, when the board president asks, is there any new business? There's, the, there's an opportunity for a board member to bring something up. Now, what I will say is, you don't want that to be an I gotcha moment either. Um, because here's an opportunity. If you know you're going to you're going to want to bring that up during new business, let the board president know. Let the superintendent know. I'm going to be bringing up this uh, new math program I saw as a as, as something that I think the board should have the district look into. At, and I'm going to bring it up under new business. That's a heads up to the board president as well as the superintendent because the superintendent may be may actually go off and do some research anyway, so that. He's prepared for the conversation that is going to come up in new business. And instead of just a conversation where, you know, the superintendent's hearing it for the first time, superintendent may be able to add some information to that conversation. And then the board may say, you know what, this sounds like something we should look into. Let's give it to the curriculum committee to go off and work. All right. So that's another way to do it. 
and get something brought, you know, without, without violating the code of ethics. So those two examples there. Number nine, former teacher, uh, at, um, it, um, as a former teacher at the high school, a board of education member, Kate Armstrong, is often approached by the teachers because she knows they are more comfortable with her than with the superintendent. She encourages them to come to her with their problems and concerns. No, is that appropriate? Everybody's shaking their head. No, it's not appropriate. Right? Same, same principle. If they come to you with concerns or problems, you need to refer them to the chain of command. They need to bring them up to their principal, supervisor. Um, if, if someone brings a concern to you, heads up, help them use the chain of command and then, uh, um, and then give the superintendent a heads up. If it's a teacher's association member and they have a complaint or a concern, you refer them back to their, uh, their membership, to their membership leadership. Because every contract has a grievance process, right? How complaints, concerns get handled, you need to follow the contract if it's a, if it's a uh, um, um, represented staff member. So this is important to understand, don't cross that line. And then the last scenario, Jim Berenger, and a uh, board member knows that New Jersey state law requires that all curriculum meet the standards set out in the New Jersey uh, student learning standards. In order to ensure that their curriculum meets those standards, he decides to go to the elementary school and question teachers and administrators about the implementation of the curriculum and whether they believe that it's meeting the standards. Is this appropriate? No. Definitely no, right? Um, number one, doesn't have the authority to just enter schools. Like I said, you have no more authority than any other member of the public. So you need to follow the policies. There is a visitation policy that says, you know, how a board, how any person gets into the school. Number two, going to the school uh, for your child is one thing. You sign in, you go to whatever conference or whatever you're doing as a parent. That's different than coming as a board member signing in wanting to do board business. You, unless the board has given you the authority to do that, you cannot do that. So, so this is important to understand. You know, quite, you know, you will get yourself in big time trouble trying to do something like that and going into districts and into, into the school buildings. All right, so those are 10 scenarios. Hopefully the different scenarios illustrate the elements of what really are your roles as a board member, things you can and cannot do, things you need to keep in the back of your mind as, as things are occurring so that you don't cross that line and step on a landmine that'll get you in trouble. So let's talk about personnel. Um, let me, I'm gonna stop sharing this and take and, and bring up the document that I talked about. One of the documents that I sent to you Let's see. Give me one second to find the, the right application. Probably should have closed a bunch of my applications. That would have made it easier. Here we go. All right. Let me share this. And I'm going to take you to this document. Hopefully you can read it. If not, I can increase the font. Let me see, let me just take it up a little bit so that you, is that, if anybody can't read that or see that, let me know and I'll raise it up again. Otherwise I'll get rolling. We're gonna, we're gonna take a quiz. So let's talk, question one. All non-tenured teaching staff must receive notice of renewal or non-renewal by May 15th. Is that true or false? True. I heard it true. Anybody disagree? All right. The answer is actually true. And the point you need to remember is that by law, boards are required to approve the list of employees to be offered contracts at a board meeting by May 15th every year. Right. Question two, while the board must have the superintendent's recommendation to hire a new staff member, 
they do not need the superintendent's recommendation to rehire. Is that true or false? It's kind of quiet. I think it's false. PS all recommendations. Somebody, somebody gave a false. The answer is false. The board must have the superintendent's recommendation to hire or rehire any staff member. In essence, when it comes to personnel, hire, fire, transfer, et cetera, et cetera, you need the superintendent's recommendation. That's important. Number three, board members may see staff files, that's personnel files, and evaluations at any time for any reason. True or false? False. Oh, I'm hearing false. Anybody think true? The answer is false. Board members may only see staff files and evaluations when they are asked to make a decision that affects that staff member's employment in the district. They may only see those portions of the employee's personnel file directly pertaining to the decision that is being made. For example, we talked about uh, the list of uh, renewal of staff. You get that list in your in your packet and you look at it and you say, okay, I've got a concern with one of the staff members. Because you're going to be voting on this and it impacts the employment of those folks on that list, you can ask the superintendent say, I'd like to see the evaluations of employee X. You would the super you would arrange it, you would make an appointment with the superintendent, you'd go into the office, superintendent would pull that personnel folder of that employee, pull the evaluations out, show them to you. You could review those, ask questions. You can't make copies or anything of that nature, but you're allowed to see them and ask any questions you have. And then they go back in the file, boom, you're done, and you and you can leave. But because you are you have to vote on something that impacts that employee's em employment, you have a right to ask to see the evaluations. Um, and so that's important that's 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 important to understand. Otherwise, you don't have any right to see anything in those folders on a, on a normal basis. So it's important to understand that. Now, one of the things I'll point out that in if if your superintendent's coming to you with recommendations for, tenure charges on an employee, you're probably going to see just about everything in that employee's folder as part of the tenure process. Uh, yeah. But other than a tenure process, you're limited in what you can see in the folder and only under certain circumstances where your decision may impact the employee employment of that employee. Number four, board members must support the superintendent's staffing recommendations, true or false? False. False. I hear that was said very loudly, boy. Uh, that's actually false and that's correct. Board members are not required to support the superintendent staffing recommendations, but they may not base their decisions on arbitrary and capricious reasons. Code of Ethics says you're going to vote to appoint the best qualified personnel available after consideration of the recommendation of the chief administrative officer. Once you have that recommendation, you're required to consider it, but then in the end, you need to make an informed vote that, that you can live with. All right, item question five. Board members should solicit input on all non-tenured staff members prior to making a decision on rehiring. True or false? False. False, I, th I think I heard somebody say true, yeah. but it's, it actually is false. It isn't necessary for the board to solicit input for every non-tenured staff member beyond that provided with the recommendation for rehiring by the superintendent. Um, because they're non-tenured, they're on a basic, they're on a year-to-year -year contract. And that's that's how that works. Tenured folks, um, that's a different story, right? If if something um, if um if there's a, a situation of uh, for rehiring of tenure, you need to you need, that, you need to definitely have information and, and um, as it relates to why superintendent is recommending that person for tenure, because that's a major milestone in the career of an, of an educator. So you want to, and that, that decision shouldn't be done lightly. The board should feel confident that when 
that, that based on that recommendation, you're awarding somebody tenure um, that you that you feel good about that. Um, number six, boards should have a clear policy on attracting, hiring, developing, and retaining staff. True or false? True. True. Like I said, one of your major responsibilities is policy. And every district should have a solid set of policies that outline their uh, hiring practices, you know, everything within their personnel arena. So it's, it's a major responsibility. Number seven, staff members who are not re rehired can ask for a letter of reasons, true or false? True. True. Yep. The answer is true. They can ask for a letter of reasons. Who's responsible for providing that letter of reasons? Superintendent. The superintendent, exactly. Not the board, it's the superintendent that's required to provide that employee with the letter of reasons. Number eight, staff members who are not rehired may ask for a hearing before the board. True or false? True. True. That is true. And that hearing has a official name. It's called a Donaldson hearing. And it's actually, and I'll point out, it's not actually a hearing in the true sense of a hearing. It's the employee's opportunity to tell the board why they should rehire them. Um, it's, not, it's not a hearing per se, like you would have a, you know, a swearing in, a question and answer. It's a Donaldson session uh, that's required by law. Donaldson is the case law that made that a responsibility of the board to, to give if, if a member requests it. Uh, question nine, after a hearing before, a Donaldson hearing before the board, the board may rehire the staff member even if the superintendent does not recommend the rehire. True or false? True. It, it's true. Uh, you know, a Donaldson hearing, the person can come and state their case, plead their case, tell you why they should be re rehired. And then the board can say, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, you coming in here and, and giving us this information. You know, the board will deliberate and the superintendent will let you know what our decision is. Then the board will deliberate in executive session and the board can actually reverse that decision of the superintendent and tell the superintendent, we're gonna rehire this person. Now, we tell the boards, be very careful if you ever get in that situation and you're going to make a decision to rehire someone that the superintendent has recommended that you not rehire because that sends a message. And if you do that too many times, that sends an even bigger message to the superintendent and the public that maybe you don't have confidence in his ability to manage personnel, all right? So that's something you should take very seriously if you, as a board, if you ever find yourself in that situation and think long and hard before you make that decision. And then the last number one, question number 10, the most critical staffing decisions that a board makes deal with the selection and retention of the superintendent, true or false? True. True. Um, uh, boards always hear me tell um, tell tell folks routinely to our boards routinely the most important thing that a board does for the achievement of uh, improving student achievement in a district is the hiring of a superintendent. So um, so great. You guys took a quiz. Guess what? That that those ten questions. Um, um, I will be sending you later this evening, in addition to a handout of the presentation that, that I gave, uh, this handout again with all the answers, because this is all you need to know as it relates to your role in personnel, are the answers to these 10 questions. Let me go back to the presentation. Uh, let's see. Um, all right. That phone keeps ringing, but all right. Uh, can you see the, let's take a quiz chart. All right, great. All right. So in summary, 
we talked about the four functions of a board. Understand what they are because they, they are your major bailiwick of what you do as a board, policy planning, oversight appraisal, and two-way communication. We talked about that matrix, right? The what and the how. Make sure you understand that and respect those swim lanes. It's important to respect the swim lanes. You are the how, you are the what? Superintendent and his team are the how. Personnel, we just went through that quiz. Know what you should know. That quiz, when you get the ant one, the quiz with the answers, put that in your board bag. That's everything in personnel that you, you need to know as, as far as your responsibilities. Chain of command. A lot of the things we talked about tonight in the scenarios revolves around chain of command. Use the chain of command effectively. As a board member, refer, refer your stakeholders, your constituents to the chain of command to get their concerns and problems resolved. Know the policy that helps them do that. For you as a board member, you have an issue or a concern. Your chain of command is a one-stop shop to the superintendent, observe the chain of command. And remember that, you know, um, you are a board, you know, it's a team sport. You guys aren't gonna get it. The individuals aren't gonna get anything done as individuals. It's a team sport. You gotta work to the you work as a team. And the bottom line is you're there for the children. The team should be working for the betterment of the education process for all of the children in your district. And one of the things we find when you know, a board is having trouble and the dynamics start to fall apart, it usually stems from a lack of communication. So it's important that as a board, you communicate, 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 and then communicate more. It's important, you can't over communicate. Understanding each other, respecting each other and keeping the lines of communication open making sure you understand what your communication protocols are. If you don't have them, it's, it's a exercise that's worth doing to determine how you all expect each other to communicate with yourselves, with the community, with the staff, the superintendent, et cetera. Understanding those expectations and what you can and cannot do are important to keeping the board dynamics positive, professional and moving forward to make the uh, difference in the district. So that's, uh, again, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So open it up for questions. I'll stop sharing. There we go. Uh, any board members with any questions or comments? No questions, but uh, thank you, Jesse, for taking the time to, to walk us through all this. Oh, no problem. And, um, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and if there are no questions, I'll get out of your way because I know you got your regular meeting that needs to get started. But I do appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully uh, this information is helpful and hopefully it shapes you know, your thinking as a board on how to be a better governing body uh, for your Delanco community. So thanks a lot. Have a great night and see you next time. Thank you, Jesse. All right. Good night, all. Thank Good you, night. Jesse. Okay. I'll move this along and we'll start with the approval of minutes of the February 10th, 2021 regular ses session meeting, Exhibit B. Can I have a motion? So moved. I'll second. Cam Jenkins. Questions and comments? Comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Okay, if I could get a motion please to accept the reports of secretary and treasurer for January, 2021, which are in agreement. So moved. Thank you, Bob. I'll second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries, thank you. 
community liaison reports, please. If anybody from Riverside would like to speak at this time. Yeah, I don't think that that representative is here. Um, is there anyone? So, um, Mrs. Karamanu, I, I reached out to Riverside and they said that Gracie Iwanicki was not going to be able to participate in the meetings, uh, but that they would be filtering information through uh, Cameron Jenkins as the liaison, but that his report comes later. So Perfect. Sounds great. Is there anyone from the Delanco PTO that would like to speak at this time? Okay. Is there anyone from DISA, Recreation, or the Township Committee that would like to speak? Hi, Mrs. Cameron again. It's Matt Bartlett from DISA. Uh, we are currently having our registration. Uh, it's ongoing for our spring season of baseball, softball, and t-ball. Registration ends on March 15th, and we're actually doing a registration event at the firehouse here in Delanco tomorrow night from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. If anybody would like to come in person and sign up, you're welcome to come down and do that. But uh, we look forward to a great season. Awesome. Thank you so much. We you're appreciate welcome. that information. Okay, so now I'm going to put in or speak my president's message. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for virtually attending this evening's school board meeting. I can't believe we are now into the month of March and trending close to our one year anniversary of this new normal. On a positive note, we are with, excuse me, on a positive note, with the emergence of spring, it also brings about the symbolism of change. We as a school board are hopeful to see these changes in our world, our community, and in our school. The positive changes are what make each day worth it. But what makes tonight worth it are our students of the month. So without further delay, I will now pass this virtual microphone once again to our superintendent so that he can present our students with some well-deserved praise. Mr. Mercier. Thank you, Mrs. Karmanugian. So we, we always say this is the best part of the evening because we get a chance to recognize our students for doing a great job. Uh, before we talk about the students though, I just, I also, I uh, want to reiterate what I've stated over the months that I truly appreciate the work of every staff member, uh, of every parent, and of every student, and everyone that's involved in the education of the children, especially now. Uh, over the past year, it's been the most challenging year that we've ever seen in education, and the, the teamwork that we've seen, and all of the, just the efforts of everyone out there is just amazing. I appreciate it. So, we're recognizing the children, but I also want to recognize the adults. I, I mentioned to uh, one of our staff members the other day that we can't make it happen without you. You know, I could put a plan together that's amazing on paper, but without the staff, it doesn't happen. So I appreciate the staff for making it happen. Likewise for the parents, you know, we could put a plan in place and we need the parents on board with that plan to, uh, to make it happen at home for the kids that are doing things virtually. So I I appreciate the adults as well right now before we talk about the students. So thank you for that. Uh, so without further ado, when it comes to students, uh, we have a list here that was provided by the school principals. And what typically happens each month is the principals are gathering up names from staff members that are nominating students for these honors. So this is not random. Uh, this is not a lottery. This is happening based on staff members seeing the students do fantastic things during our hybrid and our virtual education that's happening. So uh, what I'd like to start with is Walnut. And these are recommendations that Mrs. Noble received from teachers. And so uh, here we go. So for Walnut, the very first student we want to recognize, and give praise and encouragement to is our Walnut Whiz Kid, uh, a student that's basically just well-rounded and doing an amazing job, and that is Haley Stillwagon. Congratulations, Haley. Uh, we also have students that are being recognized for perfect participation, and every time I see this, I just wonder, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings. I, I don't think that I've had perfect participation, so these students are doing an amazing job uh, with that, so that um, that's Kaylin Walter and Hunter Bilowski, so congratulations to those two students. Perfect participation. Next, uh, the dedicated student. So these are students that are working hard and just staying focused on, on schoolwork and also just being dedicated to everything related to being a, a very effective and successful student. So those students are 
Alyssa Stillwagon and Cheyenne Sight. So congratulations to Alyssa and Cheyenne. Next, we have most conscientious. So these are students that are definitely meticulous when it comes to the details, the schoolwork, everything that needs to happen uh, when it comes to homework and everything else that's, that's happening instructionally. So the most conscientious for this month for Walnut are Victoria Iwanicki and Kayla Arnold. Congratulations to those two students. Next, uh, we've selected a scientist at Walnut, a student doing an amazing job in science. That is Gianna Teat. Congratulations to Gianna. Next, we have a wonderful writer that was selected. And so, of course, that student's doing very well in ELA, English Language Arts, especially in writing. And that is Lillian Brisky. Congratulations, Lillian. Next, uh, we have the artist of the month. And uh, of course, that relates to art class. That's Arabelle Hedaway. Well done, Arabelle. And uh, the athlete of the month. Uh, so this is someone that's selected based on uh, not necessarily the athletic program, because as you know, we're not, we're not running an athletic program right now, but based on athletic ability that they're showing in physical education class and maybe out there in the community, uh, that is Luis Rosa. So congratulations to Luis. And finally, last but not least, we have a wonderful musician that was selected for Walnut, and that musician is Ryan Flanagan. So congratulations to all of those Walnut students for being nominated and selected for these honors. Uh, next, we're gonna move on to Pearson. And so uh, again, these students were selected by their teachers and then the teachers gave the names to Mr. Conti, which he, he then gave the names to me. So we're all very proud of these students for doing a great job during the month of February. And uh, those students are um, in Mrs. Arangio's class, we have Leonardo de Souza. Congratulations to Leonardo. Uh, next, in Mrs. Crozier's class, we have Ethan Merrill. Congratulations to Ethan. So those are our two wonderful kindergartners. Moving on to first grade, we have Miss Smith's class, and that is Kai Sharma. Congratulations to Kai. Uh, moving on to Mrs. Weller, we have Milana Abel. I saw Milana on here just a few minutes ago, but I'm, I'm actually looking at a different screen while I'm reading this. Um, we also now have our second graders uh, from Ms. Lipinski's class. We have Jack Rader. Congratulations to Jack. Uh, in Mrs. McCann's class, the student being recognized is Bryn Greenidge. Congratulations to Bryn. Uh, next, uh, for third grade, Mrs. Barbara's class, Hunter Campbell. Congratulations to Hunter. Uh, third grade, Mrs. Fitzwater's class, that is... Gavin Bartlett, and I, I think we have a proud dad that was on here at least just a few minutes ago. Uh, next for fourth grade, uh, Mr. Stockton, that's Ariana Heggy. Congratulations to Ariana. Uh, our next student for Ms. Wallace is Ariana Alexander. So apparently we have two wonderful students named Ariana in fourth grade. Awesome. Uh, next we have fifth grade, uh, Mrs. Brendel's class. That's currently being covered by Miss Letton. Uh, the student selected for that class is Gavin Mulligan. Congratulations to Gavin. And last but not least, uh, for Mrs. Guckin's fifth grade class, we have Haley Claus. So congratulations to Haley. Congratulations once again to all these Pearson students for doing a fantastic job during the month of February. And it's my guess that they're doing it all the time, not just in February, but that's when they were nominated and selected. So. Uh, Mrs. Karamanugian, that's what I have for student recognition. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And parents, if you wanted to stay, we're going to have a brief conversation with um, a member of our technology group to discuss the issues that we've been experiencing in the past. So if you would like to stay, you're more than welcome. If you'd like to log off, I, we totally understand. Um, I believe that Mr. Uh, Aray is present. If he would like to speak at this time, that would be great. I'm sorry if I didn't say your last name correct. I know I saw him. Yes, I am here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no problem. It is it is Jeff Airy, but oh, Airy. Uh, you know, a lot of people mix it up. That's not a problem <laughs> at all. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for giving me uh, giving me the time to speak here. Appreciate that. Um, just kind of start off with a summary, I guess. Um, Morristown took over uh, the shared services for Delenco about three years ago now, I believe it was. 
Um, you know, in that time we've had, we've had a few challenges that we had to, uh, overcome, um, especially when we started first providing the services, we inherited a few problems from the prior service provider. Uh, but over time, we've been able to incrementally improve the infrastructure uh, while also being as fiscally conservative as possible. Um, some of these improvements are more visible than others, and some are rather behind the scenes, but they've all kind of moved Delenco in the right direction. Delenco has experienced a few issues that occurred uh, for some circumstances beyond the district's direct control. And we really worked as quickly as possible to try to correct those problems and return to normal service. The most recent one was um, just a couple of days ago. It was an, an interesting problem in that uh, the Delanco.com domain name, your, your name on the internet uh, has to be renewed periodically and the provider is Network Solutions. And we actually did renew it in February and got a confirmation and everything it looked great. So we didn't think anything of it. And then a couple of days ago, uh, Network Solutions turned off the domain and we were very puzzled as to why we contacted them and they said, oh yeah, you did pay it, but we, we messed up and we turned you off. So we'll put you back in. They did that. And then the next day, another person from Network Solutions said, hey, you haven't paid us yet. So we're gonna turn you off. Um, so we finally straightened it out with them. They're talking to each other now. And the domain is, um, is functional once again. The trouble with them turning off the domain though, is that it usually takes about 24 hours for changes like that to take effect across the internet. So it's possible that when they turned it back on, certain people could get to the website and others couldn't. And it took a little while for it to all uh, synchronize. That's the most recent example. We've had some other issues with, um, uh, there was a, uh, what's called a denial of service attack was earlier um, this school year. It started in uh, late November. Uh, and that was a tough one to, to take care of because it's something that we really can't directly fix ourselves. We have to work with the internet service provider uh, Axtel is, is the provider for Delanco. Um, took them a couple iterations to get it fixed, but they eventually did. We really haven't had any problems uh, since early January, I believe it was, uh, when they had it fixed there. And before that, we've had some trouble. Um, there, was a, there was a fiber cut once. Uh, squirrels having fun with the lines, chewed right through it. <laughs> uh, got that corrected pretty quickly. Um, and then there've been a few server issues over the, over the past couple of years. And again, that comes back to making sure that we were, we're on a good schedule for replacing hardware, for upgrading hardware, for doing all the security um, updates that need to happen to those, those pieces of equipment. And uh, uh, again, while being fiscally conservative as much as possible. So it hasn't been perfect, but uh, you know, I, I hope that we've done a pretty good job. I think we've done a pretty good job supporting Delanco. Um, really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. It's been great working with uh, you know, the superintendent, Joe, um, Vicki, Albert is, is the man on the ground there at Delanco. He does a great job. And my team is backing up um, everything that they do um, as much as we can. And um, yeah, it's a pretty good, Good summary of how things are going. Do you have any questions for me that I could answer? Um, I personally do not, um, but I do appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to kind of inform the public because I know that it's impacted a lot of different um, people in our community. And we felt that um, it would be great to, to give them a, a little glimpse into why these issues are happening so that we can, so that they understand that we are attempting to address them as quickly as possible when we can impact them as quickly as possible. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I do have one quick question. Um, I don't know this off the top of my head, uh, but first of all, Jeff, uh, uh, thanks for the report. And um, sounds like you're doing a great job. The, the complexity of these systems is immense and they're really fragile, which I know from hmm. firsthand experience. Um, uh, is it possible, okay, so here's the question. Is it possible to switch to another domain registrar? Um, Right. Or yeah, how you have <laughs> that, that may be, it seems like uh, this kind of mistake, it might be worth considering next time we have to re-up the domain. 
Agreed. Yes. And, and they certainly dropped the ball on this one, which is surprising because network network solutions, our provider is, is pretty well known. They've been around the block for many years. Um, I've, I've used them before. Uh, I haven't recently. The one that I've been using recently is uh, GoDaddy, which is a kind of a silly name for a registrar, if you ask me. That's what but, I always use. Yeah. Yeah, but they, they do pretty well. And I think they might be a slightly bit cheaper than Network Solutions last I checked. I mean, it's, you know, registering a domain name is maybe a hundred bucks a year. And this might be a difference of a few dozen bucks, but it's something I think we can definitely look into as an option. Who's to yeah, say that it might be a, a problem with- a year is not a good deal. But yeah, I, yeah, no, it really is. Well, we got some, we do have some extra services in there, like the private registration, I believe. I don't know the exact amount, but you know, it's, 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 gotcha. um, it's not too bad. I think that was actually for two year renewal. Um, yeah, if you saying yes, it was two years for about a hundred plus some services, uh, but we'll look into that. See some other. Yeah, it was for two years. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Jeff, yeah. Vince Caliguire, quick question. Um, have we talked to network solutions about getting some compensation for the mistake that was on their part? Or it might be for really for missing Mr. Mercy, but just wondering if we had any. We, I believe we received a, a discount on the service, which is since it only costs about a hundred dollars per two years, the discount is minimal. Yeah, it's minimal. Uh, so just just to follow up on what Ari is saying, and Jeff, I appreciate uh, what you've shared. These issues frustrate everyone, uh, from students to parents to staff. To, to everyone, Admin, teachers, administrators, you name it, board members, yeah, very frustrating. But all the emotions about it don't necessarily fix it. And, and that's, that's, what I, that's what I was telling myself over the past three days. I mean, I was very frustrated about the internet going down because of the firewall and the, you know, the website going down, the email going down. And it's like, these are things that we rely on and mm -hmm. going on with it. And the tech team, I think, did a really nice job of fixing it. In, in the amount of time that they did, knowing that this was not something the district even caused, this was something that a, a provider caused. Uh, it was, it is a bit, it's something that definitely frustrates me more though, to know that, you know, it's a hundred dollar uh, invoice that, you know, I'm sure a lot of us out there are paying more for so many other things in life than a hundred dollars for the entire website and email service for our district. Hey, I just want to stop you. That's not a, that's not yeah. for the, all the web service and email. That, that's for just the domain registration, just .com. Cool. Well, And actually, hundred dollars for two years, I would say, is not a very good deal. Uh, probably about well, twenty five dollars for two years is more like what well, I would say. Well, regardless of that, Stephen, I think that it's negligible to be quite honest. And for them to pull the plug on us for claiming that we didn't pay one hundred dollars is absolutely ridiculous to me. So, it, do you know what I mean? Like hundred dollars. There was clearly a mistake on that. Yeah, you know, it's it. They they could have said, well, you know, you you didn't pay even though we did, and given some warning. Instead, they pull the plug suddenly and then cause all of these issues. So I just want everyone here to know that I share in that frustration, uh, and I share in the fact that, you know, a lot of times people are looking for somebody to blame and saying, well, whose fault is this? Who didn't do their job? And so on and so forth. And and the Morristown Tech team, including Albert Pinero did everything they could, but it, you, you can't see this punch coming when a company just suddenly pulls the plug like, like that. You know, so I, I just think that, you know, it's not even about the hundred dollars. It's about the fact that if we're paying for a service, we absolutely paid for it. They should have had a record of it and they should have never pulled the plug on us. Or at least so, I'll call you. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I think you're, you know, the, the, the frustration with network solutions is totally legitimate. It sounds like they made a big mistake. Just that this is, my philosophical position on this is that um, I'm always, as somebody who spent a lot of time with technology, I'm kind of always expecting everything to be broken all the time. <laughs> so the fact that it runs, you know, the rest of the year is pretty incredible to me. So I think it's a credit to the staff and it's, uh, yeah, this is tough, but uh, hopefully it's behind us. I agree with you. The fact that any technology works at all is miraculous sometimes. <laughs> That's not a statement on Albert or Jeff or anybody, but it's the fact that, I mean, we're living in the 21st century where, you know, even just as, as early as my childhood or the childhood of some other people here, that there was nothing like this around, you know, so it's, yeah. it's really indistinguishable from magic or miracles at times. And, and 
for them to make it happen the way they do, I appreciate it. But when, when something goes wrong, you know, we need our team to respond and they did. And I, I appreciate that. And we always try to be as proactive as possible, but sometimes we just have to re react to things as quickly as we can and get them fixed. And, and we know it's, it's a burden for everybody and it's, it's stressful and, you know, we try to do it as best we can. Thank you. We appreciate that. And again, we appreciate you um, joining us this evening to, to spread the word as, and to provide some Absolutely. information. Thank you. Absolutely. So You're so welcome. I hope the next time we can all be in person. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, I will now open this up for public comment on agenda items only. Okay. Hi, this is Wendy Flanagan from PTO. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry I missed the liaison report. Um, we would like to thank everyone who ordered spirit wear. Um, the spirit wear had been opened up for one extra week until March 7th. Once it closed, um, they will require a couple weeks to print everything and get it out to everybody. But I just wanted to give that update to everyone that spirit wear is being printed as we speak and we'll get to you soon. Also, our next uh, PTO meeting is March 16th at 7 p.m. Um, uh, an email with a link will be coming home by the end of the week. That's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Is there anybody else that would like to make a comment on an agenda item? Okay, I don't see any hands up. So I will close it at this time and we will now move on to the superintendent's report, Mr. Mersinger. All right, thank you, Mrs. Karamanuki, and I appreciate that. And um, when it comes to the superintendent's report, a motion is requested for the following items, letters A through E, uh, which are on the agenda. I have no additional commentary at this time, so a motion is requested. I'll make the motion. Second it. Jenkins and Bob Dovey. Okay, questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? The motion carries, thank you. Thank you. You got it. Instruction and Program Committee. Um, this is my committee, so um, I will just let you know that the CST BOE update reclassifications and placements, confidentials per exhibit I. That's all I have. And now we will move on to the Finance Committee report, Mr. Litwack. <clears throat> Where's Harry? <laughs> I see him. You're on mute in case you're speaking. Oh, there we go, I think. There he is. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. On my screen, it says mute. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's been confusing. Um, and let me get to the agenda. Here we go. Where did that go? Okay. I'm waiting for the agenda to open. I had it up and here we go. No problem. Yeah. Well, as the resident board Luddite, I'm glad that the technology is working. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion for necessary line item. Uh, I'm asking for a motion to approve the following A, necessary line item transfer from January 2021, Exhibit J. B, monthly line item, monthly line account certification for January 2021. C, payment of bills in the amount of $840,039.99 as per attached bill list, exhibit K. D, accept anonymous donation in the amount of $100 to support the music program. E, special education tuition contract with Burlington County Special Services School District commencing 22221 
through 6, 21, 21 for the one student to attend at an annual rate of $40,885 prorated. Yeah. Special education tuition contract academy commencing 9-23-21 through 6-30-21 for one student to attend at an annual rate of $25,605.58 prorated. G, transportation with Cinnaminson Board of Education to provide transportation for two students at an estimated amount of $17,646 prorated. H, transportation with the ARC Transit LLC to provide transportation for one student at a daily rate of $108 per day. I, Nutra Service Monthly Report for January 2021, Exhibit L. J, ratification of bills paid in the amount of $88.54 with check number 216 for January 2021 exhibit M. So I've made that motion. And may I have a second, please? Vince, I second. Thank you, Vince. Questions, Thank comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Operations and Facilities Committee report, Mr. Caliguire. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we had our meeting, uh, facility meeting. We haven't had one in a long time since I've been uh, with the Facilities Committee, and it was good to have one. Um, Mr. Dovey and Mr. Laughlin were joining me in the meeting, and what we were able to find out is how hard Tim and his crew are working at the school, really are. And with the limited funds they have available, they're doing some, some great work. You could tell from the way they were speaking about everybody. They have real concern for the kids there. I want all parents to know that uh, you know you can feel safe knowing that the folks that we have taking care of facilities are doing a great job and they really believe in it. That being said, let me read the uh, committee report for you. Mm -hmm. uh, for the month of February, routine maintenance activities, schools were in hybrid sessions due to uh, coronavirus. Obviously we had snow removal because we had snow. Uh, completion of work orders is needed. Uh, special project activities, uh, three carts were put together and uh, they were hung with Promethean boards on each cart for three classroom, classrooms at Walnut. We took down uh, old smart boards at three class, classrooms at Walnut, took down three old smart boards at Pearson, hung three new uh, Promethean at uh, Pearson, fixed broken heating coil room 17 at Pearson. They rehung the uh, smart board in classroom four at Pearson that was removed from classroom nine at Pearson to install a Promethean board. And they had the uh, HVAC uh, computer system upgraded at Pearson, that's a good thing. And uh, that's all I have to report. Is there any questions? Let me know. Thank you. Well, that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Policy. This, this is Mr. Cameron Nugent. Before oh, sorry. we move on, I just want to take a moment to also thank Tim Allen and the members of his team for what they do for the facility. As Mr. Caliguire is saying, Tim provided a, a lot of thorough information during the meeting. But one thing that Tim always says, and you know, he believes it in his heart absolutely, that he treats this situation here as, as though this is like his home and his child is in it. Mm -hmm. Says, you know, if, if my child were here, I would want it to be clean this way. I would want it to be sanitized. I would want things functioning properly. So he looks at it that way. And, and I mean, he emphasizes that all the time that the children here, he wants them to be treated the same way he would treat his own child in that scenario. So I appreciate Tim for, for his philosophy and mindset as well as, as the actions of of him and his team. Yes, he definitely exhibited a uh, great pride for, you know, in regards to what he does with his team. So it was, it was great to hear and, and great, great to witness as well. Okay, uh, policy committee report, report. Ms. Darmo. It's me to read through each policy or just say exhibit L. Um, you could, you could just say the, the, um, you could just name the exhibit or something. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have to read all of the policies. Right. Okay. As the policy committee chairperson, I make a motion to enter on first reading the policies and regulations, which are included in the board packet found in Strauss SMA alert 221, which is exhibit L. Okay. And may I have a second, please? Second. Steve. Thank you, Steve. 
questions or comments? Is there anything, this is Harry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, I can. Okay. Vera, is there anything in these that we should be aware of that's, you know, either problematic or there was any uh, questioning? Um, just as Mr. Mersinger sent in our email, there was one policy about electronic transfer of funds that um, Victoria is just going to look into a little bit more before we vote on that. So we're just waiting on that one policy. So that's not in here? Yeah, that's we're not um, voting on that today. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other additional questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries, thank you. I just have one quick question. I see in here there's school district security and there's a P7440 and an R7440. They're just two distinct security. It's policy and regulation, I believe. Okay, 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 I see. That's correct, see. policy and regulation. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see it now with the others. Thank you. No problem, thank you. Personnel Committee Report, Mr. C. Jenkins. Thank you, Marissa. I will make a motion to approve the following letters A through E with no special notes on any of them. I will make the motion. May I have a second, please? All second. Thank you, Phil. Questions or comments? Okay, this is a roll call vote. Mr. Caliguire, you're on mute. I vote yes. <laughs> Ms. Dharma. Yes. Mr. Dovey. Yes. Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Yes. Mr. Phil Jenkins. Yes. Mrs. Cameron Ugin. Yes. Mr. Litwack. Yes. Mr. McLaughlin. Yes. Ms. Tersich Keeley. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Board liaison reports. Riverside School District. Mr. C. Jenkins. All right. At last month, I believe it was February 11th, Riverside School meeting, we discussed uh, details of Riverside budget and their public budget meeting will be at the end of April. Uh, we talked about different possibilities for how to make sports night happen. Obviously, we want to make that happen for the kids. Uh, more different options with senior trip, because I know, I believe, Riverside right now, it's either go on senior trip and don't be present at graduation or go to graduation and be present but don't go to senior trip. I believe it's something like that. Um, they're talking different options for bringing kids back into the school, like having the seniors there for four days a week, and then the, the next week have juniors there for four days a week, different options like that. Uh, a senior that was from Delanco, Amanda Sweet, she did get student of the month last month, so congrats to her. Uh, we talked more support for virtual learning. I'm pretty sure at most schools are on the same page with that. And uh, obviously we're still in the process of doing uh, hiring a new superintendent at Riverside. So we set our schedule. I believe we posted advertisements for that. I'm sure Joe's probably seen it on the proper forums. And that's about all I have to report, Madam President. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. I appreciate that. Um, NJSBA and BCSBA, Mr. Litwack. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there was a, a county meeting on the 22nd of February, and a couple of they, most of it was about the athletics in New Jersey, the NJSIAA, and it was primarily high school related. Um, some of the issues are that came up was for board resolutions that the possibility of staff time to get shots, time off the school day, um, and they may need to take a sick day after the second shot if there's reactions. Um, the, they talked about the uh, CDC certification for HVAC, air vents, univents, filtration systems. 
you cannot force teachers to get vaccinated. That's an important point. And then there was another meeting uh, just on the 8th yesterday, and it was just wonderful. It was um, about the uncertainty of emotion. And the woman who presented it, Amy Hassa, is a, um, you know, a certified MSW. She's also a board member. So she really understands what's going on. And it was really about uh, recognizing your own triggers through reflection, planning for stress, conflict resolution and emotional triggers, coming to terms with what we can control. And this was, this was really focused on adults, teachers, staff, board members, who, you know, the fact that control, we all want to control as much as we can in our lives. And one of the things is to understand your locus of control, what really is in your control and focus and what you can't control to separate them. People are hurting now, it's uh, pretty obvious. Um, and they talked about, and this is an interesting concept, embedded wellness to plan with purpose, creatively, a willingness to make a positive routine, have breakthrough strategies. They also just mentioned, and I've been, I've been doing yoga and breathing exercises for 45 years about breathing. And it's a simple thing to teach people for, for six breathing, and there's other patterns, but a basic and within three breaths, you literally um, stay, but you have to learn it to begin with. They use it a lot now, I know, with um, the special programs that they have in the county for kids with emotional problems. It, it, um, the program right over near um, the, the college, near Rowan College. And they, they, they do a lot more with yoga, stress reduction, breathing, than with corporal punishment, capital punishment. Punishment, period. Uh, social connectedness, <laughs> social distancing. They said to call it social, th that we call it social distancing. We should be calling it physical distancing because that's what the problem is. We're socially distancing ourselves. Even saying that, I said, well, we just got to keep our physical distance. We mm. can interact. So it was very, uh, very much they talked about role models, mutual vulnerability. That's what, if you res can respect in other people the same vulnerability that you feel, that goes a long way in human interaction. And we all need help sometimes. Sometimes I need help, sometimes you need help. And all this, you can, you if you go on the School Board Association uh, your website, it's under, you, you can, Pull this up yourself. They have it under for social anxiety training, uh, also suicide prevention, and it's under they call M mental health and and uh, training, mental health something training. So you, board members can go to that. We have, an, I believe Marissa is going to be attending on the 25th, uh, Burlington County Presidents Meeting with all the county. Uh, school district presidents, and if the president can't make it, the vice president. I was calling, and other of the um, county officers were calling. There were a few districts that hadn't put in their census report. We were up to date. Thank you, Vicki. And um, so we're getting that all together because there were some districts, there were, they have new presidents, or Mount Holly, they had a board member who had resigned, and they, they hadn't yet had the board meeting to confirm the new person so the person couldn't put it on. The things that go on in administration. But the things that I would also like to point out uh, to all our board members is the regionalization article of page 12 and 13 of the Leadership Magazine. And basically it was Steve Sweeney, who's the state senator, and um, about the LEAP grants, about the regionalization. And this was what, basically about three years ago was started upon and there was this path to progress and it's all coming back to fruition now. So it's, um, and everything is moving at kind of warp speed. They actually just passed something on Tuesday, apparently in the state of New Jersey 
to expedite all this uh, with money and they put money behind it to uh, do the feasibility study that I've been talking about. And on a nice note is that the um, Dr. Nagy, who is the superintendent at BCIT and special services for the county is all for um, regionalizing, having satellite, um, you know, to expand the campuses. And so it looks like a lot of the changes that were attempted to be done are now back on online to be done. And it looks like there's funding um, from federal monies now. And um, so we're, we're getting back on track. So I'm, I'm happy to report that. And then next Friday, I have a Friday night, a uh, director's meeting where th that I'll be at virtually attending. And then May 25th is the, um, where we have statewide, it's basically the um, meeting, the, the, the legal meeting of the board, the statewide board members. There's a term for it and it's just slipping my mind. Thank you folks. That uh, there's, it's like uh, the rest of the winter, the, the snow and the ice is kind of melted. Now we're back to hopefully being able to tackle some of these issues and problems. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ari. I appreciate it. Township committee, You're welcome. Mrs. Tersich Keeley. Hey, um, so there were two meetings since we last met. They met on February 22nd and March 1st. Um, and I just condensed my notes into one summary because I know a lot of people are in attendance at the 3-1 meeting. Um, they discussed in, that the township has received $341,000 from pilots this year, which is $100,000 more than last year. And they do expect to get an additional $50,000 yearly for a certain number of years after a recent settlement with Living Springs over some underpayments um, that they were receiving. Um, in reply to the request from the school to help with some of the financial burden caused by recent developments in town, Kate Fitzpatrick suggested using a portion of that pilot money um, for the schools since we don't receive, re currently receive any portion of that $341,000. Um, something that Edgewater Park actually has recently implemented. So that's where the idea came from. John Brown said he didn't see the value in this and um, that he would need to be worrying about the town and not the schools with that money. Fernola agreed with um, Kate Fitzpatrick and also suggested using the quote unquote found monies from Living Springs toward a potential long-term loan for the schools. Mike Templeton um, didn't see the value in assisting the schools at this time. And later in the meeting, um, Christine Holland also agreed with Templeton and Brown. Um, the township is looking at raising taxes this year, but no specific percentage has been agreed upon yet. And um, the township is debating allowing any businesses related to cannabis legalization in Delanco. They have, I think it's 180 days, some, some specific deadline um, by which they have to decide what sort of uses would be allowed or not allowed. Um, you know, the result of allowing cannabis in Delanco could potentially mean more revenue for the town, which the school would potentially share in. Um, so it's definitely something that we should uh, keep our eye on. Um, but based on comments from the committee members at the meetings, they're leaning away from gaining um, any revenue from the cannabis legalization. Um, there will, however, be a public hearing uh, for comments um, on 419, so. Great, thank you so much, very informative, thank you. I, I would like to comment on that. On, sure. Yeah, I, I was neither at the original meeting uh, nor did I watch the um, watch it, so I was trying to keep as objective as I could, and I actually approached. Uh, I've talked to a couple of the about three members, but I thought it kind of surprising, uh, Mr. Brown saying that the schools. It's like saying that the schools aren't part of the town, and the kids and the people who have kids aren't part of the town that he represents. I don't, I don't understand that, that thinking. And, you know, we're, I think Vince, you, can you hear me, Vince? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think you were the one that pointed out that we were in the county, what, yeah. 38 out of 40. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. And I did send a, a, a letter, an email to all the people on council, because I'm, I'm, I know like a lot of parents here in town, I'm very concerned about what's going on with the school. My three years here, 
you know, and with some of the new board members, with Steve and Kathy, we discovered, you know, how much of the county percent, you know, you look at the county and what each town um, gives up as a percentage of their budget to their school system. Um, when I looked at Burlington County, we are, we put in 52.8%. The county average is 63.0%. Out of the 41 towns, out of the 41 towns of Burlington County, we are 37 in terms of, of the percentage of funding that we give the school. And it's about 15% less, I'm just dropping it out in my head, about 15% less than the average. And, and, and thank you for bringing those up, Harry, because I think parents need to know this, where, you know, it shows this doesn't just happen. That's not just an accident. That's a concerned effort, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to speak to everyone here about it because I'm concerned and I, and I do make raise this up whenever I can because it is important. Educating the youth here is important. When I see people complain about our youth here and they say that, um, you know, what's going on, what's happening? Well, you, you get what you put into it. And if we're not, we're not even average, we're not even average in terms of funding and what we're trying, trying to accomplish here. And, you know, it's a, it's a credit to, to, to Mr. Mercier and the staff of what they're doing when you look at that. Again, 37th out of 41 in the county. We're not even near the average percentage that most towns are putting into the county. But I appreciate saying my piece, thank you. Yeah, and I, th I think that was, it, you know, this has happened over time. This isn't something an overnight situation. And it, it really is, um, you know, I got in the mail today, $5 Meadows ice cream coupon, you know, it's as I can spend that as much as I can, the potential sharing. We have the, it's never been there. The potential sharing, you know, uh, go, go to the bank and tell them you want to put in potential earnings. You know, it's not a reality. That it's a reality that needs to be addressed differently. And it's not the, the board versus the township. We're all the same taxpayers. And I've been pointing it out for a number of years. And, um, I think maybe some people recognize it and some people prefer not to, but it seems uh, to me disingenuous if we're talking about giving 30 year, you know, uh, pilot programs <laughs> and, uh, you know, 30 year contracts and whatever with the library, with the school, and at the same time, never giving the schools. That's part of the town's budget is schools and in every other other town in New Jersey so it's really something that needs to be looked at and the other thing is with the pilot if there are going to you know futuristically what was the idea of you need a dedicated tax not a potential tax and that's what needs to be happening is that you know to get more money from the township to the schools by a dedicated that 50% of the pilot for the next two years goes to the school. And then after that, you reevaluate it or you say, okay, now we only need this much. But um, without, you know, the hole in our budget is directly linked to what actions the township took. Nothing the school board did. Those were actions by the township that, you know, it's like if you have a business partner and they, you know, go off and spend without you knowing it, and then you're on the hook. Harry, I want to point something out. This is Bob. Uh, Bob, yeah. The school board decides what they're going, to, what they want the taxpayers of Delanco to pay towards the school budget. The township committee is only responsible for their portion of responsibilities. The school board's responsible for theirs. It, what, what, well, what, what, uh, what, 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 Harry, let me finish. No, no, I, I don't understand what you're saying when you said for their responsibility in the school board it, for theirs. What is, the town, what is the responsibility? It, just like we have statutory responsibilities, they also have statutory responsibilities. That's correct, but they're okay. different. They are, funding, they, they are funding their responsibilities. I keep hearing about... The, how we're we're forty um, seventh or whatever the heck it is in in funding our our school budget. Well, per, perhaps we, it's because the school board has not been able to raise the taxes that that's necessary to to make our our district viable um, in in certain areas, especially the special education. 
So, you know, to, to you know, the, the pilot program, I think the township has maybe five or six pilots, some of them are very small. Um, and, you know, those are not 30 years, they're 20 years or something less than that. Uh, so those aren't right. the ones affecting it though, Bob. Pardon me? Those aren't, the big ones are the one, and that one specific one is the one affecting it. How, how is that affecting the, the, because the taxes? The because the taxes only go to the council. They don't go into That's the- That's right. And they don't produce one school <laughs> child, not one. So that, you know, is, as far as that's concerned, this is something the state created years ago to try and encourage, I guess, businesses to locate in towns. And I, I agree with, the, I think the township does have an obligation when they develop a program, a pilot program, that a certain percentage based on probably the existing, ta the way the taxes are divvied up now, that should go to the school district. So if, if the school district is, you know, uh, would, would get those portion of the funds. Now, uh, you know, and, and also the fire district. So there, there are the three taxing agencies, plus then you have the, um, the sewer authority. But I just want to bring this back. To, can, can I just have a second to, to kind of bring this back to earth? I, Who's speaking? I, I, Who it's is a, speaking? Oh, I'm sorry, this is Steve. Uh, Steve McLaughlin here. Um, I, I'm, I'm just like, just want to take a step back. The, the overall picture to me, I'm, I'm looking for a, a favorable outcome for the people in this town. So if the, the school district is under pressure, we need more money or else we're going to have to fire teachers. I mean, that's the situation. So uh, if, our, if the answer from the township committee is just, we have to raise taxes significantly on the town and that's the only way we can manage to cover our expenses, then I guess the outcome is the taxes are going up significantly. <laughs> um, well, well, Steve, the situation for me, hold on one second. The situation for me looking at, at the overall uh, uh, scene in the town is that township committee seems like they're doing pretty well. I mean, the schools are under pressure. We can't pay our bills. The township committee is talking about, you know, they, it seems like they have a surplus. And it seems like, I mean, I'm looking at the, the field of dreams, which costs almost $50,000. It's a baseball field, uh, which is not used currently. It costs $50,000 a year to landscape no, that, that's a, a landscaping contract. Um, that, that could be a big portion of a teacher's salary. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking, you know, Steve, I don't want me, to raise taxes on people in this town. Steve, so let me I'm just looking out. for outcome. Steve, let me point yeah. out, the township committee is responsible for recreation, police, uh, you know, municipal waste, those types of things. They're responsible for that. They develop their budget and they, they do that every year. I understand that. My point is they, they the have money left over. You don't have is, enough money. Something's wrong. The with school, board, the school board, why, why, you know, you're looking to them if they have, if they have a surplus or something, a newfound money that they can give, fine, talk to them about it. But it's not their responsibility to fund the schools. This That's is, oh, yeah. not a fund. Bob, a fund you, Bob, you, I, my, my point is that Bob, responsibility of people is to now, raising taxes significantly should be an absolute last resort. We have to, we have to look, you know, leave no stone unturned. And we're in, this is what we're doing. We're in the process of having these conversations with the township. Mm -hmm. And we should be talking to them and saying, hey, listen, we're, we're in a position and you guys are doing a good job with that. Letting them know that we have, we have, we have a unique situation, especially with the special ed uh, and the cost of, you know, for uh, students that are, you have to go out of district. The, the cost of that's astronomical. But what I'm saying is, if you if you go at them and say, hey, you guys are spending all this money. Well, they the the, uh, the taxpayers, the voters of Delanco wanted those things. OK, now is that, you know, so they went about and they they funded it through taxes, through what, you know, uh, grants and so forth. We are responsible for the education yes. of children. Okay, so so either 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 Delanco voters want higher taxes or they want worse schools. I mean, these are the two options. Well, I got to tell you, I sat on township committee and I listened to people complain about, you know, all kinds of stuff. And the thing, you know, whether we we did have uh, adequate facilities for our children, uh, for our recreational programs, 
or whether we have, you know, there are people that want to have a uh, rec center um, and, you know, the, the cost of that would be astronomical. Uh, and you and know, those should be lower on the priority list than funding our schools. So, yeah. so but yeah, but there, there are two different boards. They have their priorities. We have ours. They're Who separate. I'm going to, uh, my priority is to fight Bob, for the kids in this town. So excuse me, Steve. Yes, but go ahead. Bob, who are you representing? You're supposed right to be repping the school board and the school board's needs, not the township. That, no, that's just freed information. Sorry, that I understand have. that. I, I, I understand that. What I'm trying to tell you is keep on attacking the township committee because they say they, they don't have a responsibility. You're not going to get any help from them. Bob, I, Bob, Bob it's I, I got to say you. this, though. There's an election in November. We're, we're dealing with the situation with the special needs, a problem we didn't create. Now, the town did the right thing and, and letting the housing happen. I understand all that. I'm not putting blame on anything. But we're, we're, we're taking the repercussions of that. When I wrote that letter, I'm going to say this, too. When you take into account that the kids go to Riverside, we have the, the least funded school district in the county. In the county, man. That's that's ridiculous for a town like us to be. Well, then, and raise the taxes. Then propose a budget that's going to raise the taxes. That's the only way you're going to, that's the only way. You're We're going limited to, to raising our taxes 2% every year. Right. That's, yes, that's our problem from the- and that's We're not only allowed to do it 2% unless there's other adjusting items. We don't have other adjusting items except for bank cap this year. It's $65,000, that's it. So we can't go above 2%. Well, we technically can go above 2% well, if with you bank put cap. it out to a vote yeah, to the community. Yeah. And then what that what happens with that is, I mean, we, we know the history of it is that whether it's in Delanco or other communities, a lot of times that would get voted down and then you have to go back to the drawing board with the budget. So anyway, I mean, it is possible. It's just a, a very difficult process to get that voted on and approved. I, I, my if I'm not mistaken, this year it'll be 3%. I think they're well, going that's up what, if we utilize back. Bank can't, can't. So, every, I mean, what people in the township know is that with the outcome of this, if we don't, it, maybe the township committee will come through with a loan and we can get through this shortfall. Right. But if the outcome is that we, we have to fire a teacher or two teachers, that will be really shooting us in the foot. That'll be a disservice to everyone in this town, in my opinion. So, if there's something Absolutely. that the township committee can do right now to help us, and I think they should do the right thing. Well, I, my suggestion would be that to form a committee, and we've already got the, the I guess, uh, part of that done to sit down and in a work session with them um, and it's going to take several meetings so that they clearly understand the situation we're in and what Vicki said you know the limitations as to what we can raise you know raise the funds I think we've been through this with them. I think they're, they're pretty clear on the on the details well, I'm even going to say that, that, that letter I wrote I'm sorry Steve but we've had a meeting yeah. from the year before and I, and I wrote that letter Kate Fitzpatrick was the only one who who contacted me about you know, concerns about it. I, 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 I have to wonder about it. And, and you know, folks who, who are watching, like, this goes back to who, you know, who we're putting in, who we're voting for. Parents, you need to run. Because if you're not, other people are, and they're going to make the decisions for you and your kids. Yeah, Kate Fitzpatrick was very supportive. Fern was supportive um, for any let, let. So that it's not that we have no support on the, on the township committee. It's not like this is complete, so completely foreign to them. It's just that we don't have Three out of five voting members that's, of the township committee. That's, and that's what you need. My, my point is, knowing the personalities, I, uh, you know, except for one person, I would suggest sitting down, talking private, you know, I say privately, you know. Oh, no. This, this, yeah. uh, I think that, I think you're, you're maybe you're, you're coming to this conversation a little bit later. Uh, but we've, I mean, this is, this is not, you know, we're now a month into this or more. I'm not coming to it late. I'm, I'm aware of what, you know, the conversation has been going on. And I've also heard the other side and I'm thinking to myself, Hey, this is not going to go anywhere. If, 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 if people keep, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say uh, rubbing people's noses in it, but blaming, blaming people for the fact that we're in trouble now financially. I mean, we're adults. I don't think, that, I don't think I'm, I'm not responsible for, for protecting the delicate feelings of members of the township committee. I mean, we're, okay. Okay. we have a serious problem in front of us. Hey, listen, do you know? You know what? I just want to say something, Bob. I appreciate him providing a, a perspective from his experience because I think that does have value and merit in regards to understanding both sides of the conversation. On the flip side, 
I do understand the impact that the decisions made have gravely affected our school di district and our budget. And because of that, we now have to make some very, very tough decisions moving forward. So we did have those previous conversations in the early stages of the budget process. Um, initial feedback was what was mentioned. Um, so that leaves us to have to now roll up our sleeves, which Vicki and Joe have done, and to really get down to see what we have to do. And unfortunately, we are in quite a hole that we have to dig out of. And in order to do that, we have to make some, like I said, very tough decisions. So we were hoping for some support, even if it was momentarily, if for like a, a year or, or so, but we, we weren't even able to get to that point in time to have that discussion in regards to that because the conversation was kind of, um, I guess it was stopped. Like this is not something we're going to discuss. We don't feel it's necessary. Three out of five did not feel strongly that this was the direction we need to go in. And like you said, that is their choice to make. It's not their job to fund the schools. We were just looking for support. And the reason why we were looking for the support is because, like I said, the decisions made and the actions had that have now impacted our ability to function properly and soundly and financially. I, I, un, I understand. Yeah. Uh, and the one issue I think you got, everybody's referring to is the, um, the new affordable housing complex has, has hurt the, uh, uh, the Delanco schools as far as funding for those special needs students and so forth. Um, I, I, I can tell you that one of the members that are that's being supportive of this uh, helping schools out was also in favor of having that because they were afraid of a lawsuit, mm -hmm. uh, affordable housing lawsuit. And that was one of the tough decisions. I personally, when I was on committee, I, I, did, I wasn't in favor of it. And I know, I know John Brown wasn't in favor of it. Um, I know uh, Mike wasn't in favor of it. So, you know, those, you know, unfortunately the planning board um, or the land use board decided that they had to do this or else the township would have faced a lawsuit over, you know, uh, not having the, the appropriate number of affordable housing units. The lawsuit and, would still be going on. History now, no. <laughs> well, hey, going hey, on. listen, there's another round coming up, Harry. There's going to be another round. And I that's know. why you want to- we got to work together. Well, that's, that's why, why we, we feel strongly exactly. that, right, that it would be better moving forward if we were partners in these endeavors. I, I agree 100%. So, so that we can all be privy to the impact and hopefully benefit from some of the benefits of these decisions, because obviously everybody's affected right. and everybody is impacted. So hopefully, because if we can't make movements forward in this area and this decision that moving forward, when these opportunities present themselves, that we are both standing together as a partner, looking at this and looking at it high level, big picture and saying, how can we make this work for everybody? And I'm hoping and, and, that we get the call to say, hey, come to the table, just like we would do for anything else to say, let's let's look at this. This is going to impact the majority. I, the amazing thing to me was when the land use board was meeting and, and pushed and pushed that as a solution. They never did they ever reach out to the school board? I, I bet the answer is no. No, no. Uh, I, I, I know other other, um, you know, committees and so forth that they weren't even consulted on it. Mm -hmm. so it was it, it was discussed. Discussed. It, 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 it they should have invited us to discuss about the pilots is the land use Sorry. board a is that a um are people just appointed to that board that's correct Harry. and how many do you know how many people are on that oh uh, i i believe it's seven it could be nine okay. but Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm having a senior moment with that. So. Uh, hey, <laughs> you know, I've known you a long time, Bob. I, you know, back BCID when you were running a business, <laughs> and I just am always trying to get what's best for the most, for the most, you know, be efficient with our money. And it was discouraging to to see that 
the way it's supposed to, when you learn how school boards work, because there's different, they're totally two different animals. The accounting yeah. systems are different, but they're right. linked together. The state, you know, links them together. But we've been under the 2% cap, just like the township. To do something, you know, because you're afraid of a lawsuit, you know, okay, that was a decision that was made by, not me, not by, it was made by some people. The repercussions of it. Been... And it's not just, we're, we're in the hole now, but that pilot is for 30 years. It's yeah. never going to, we'll, the school will never for 30 years, won't get any money from there. That's not a, if if you had a partner in business that took advantage of you that I, way. I, I wish I had some insight into that, what, how those decisions were made, because that sounds, that's outrageous to me. <laughs> Well, did you go to any of the meetings to say, hey, township committee, how come you, you're giving, you know, you're not going to give the school board any, uh, or the schools part of this money? I, you know, I sat, I guess, at the uh, last, when the Deaton Watson uh, situation, uh, the, the new folks that came in there that basically got extended into that pilot program. I didn't see anybody, I didn't see any of the members here. In that in that township meeting when that was discussed, so to come back and and say, oh, you know, you know, you were a bad person because you voted for that, I think that that's counterproductive as far as trying to get. Yeah, I, mean, I hope I hope no one in this town thinks people think they're good or bad people because of the well, way they voted you know, or that's, So 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 that's you know, not the way that i know that most of us on the board maybe, approach it. i think it's maybe, just the, maybe, the pilots weren't the pilot wasn't something that somebody dreamed up to to uh you know to, to no, make, no 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 the township bridge or get, you know be able to it it was it's a creature of the state they have created the rules for it the township committee when, when uh, I guess Dolan, who's building the new warehouses there, wanted to have a pilot and people uh, on committee were saying, no, we don't want a pilot. And I said, well, wait a second. And I was still on committee at the time. I said, why are, you know, why are you just saying no? I said, here's an opportunity to be able to give the schools a portion of that money. Now, Dolan, I think, is not getting a pilot. They're they're going to pay regular rates. So the school, the schools will get their percentage of that of that project um, of those taxes that they pay. But as far as you know, Living Springs is concerned, um, uh, you know, I think there's something with the. Uh, what is Living Springs? That's down on the highway. Like it's, a bunch uh, of what is Living Springs? I think it's 99 units. What, uh, are, what are the living apartments. springs? They're, they're, they're the apartments that are seniors only. Right. Right where, on 130. Uh, you know, where Isn't oh, okay. it by Abundant Life? I, I, yeah. yeah, it's easy to miss. Yes, yes it is. Okay. So, yeah, so that's where it's at. Okay. And, then, and you have a couple homes on Burlington Avenue um, uh, that I think are um, uh, yes. maybe affordable housing to have a pilot. I'm not sure about that. Um, but the but the it's the um, lumber place and the what used to be Deets and Watson are the are the ones that I'm familiar with, yeah. um, and I, I think we're almost halfway through the uh, the lumber um, place. There is that Boise you're talking think, about? Not Boise, no. They, no. they do not have they do not have any pilots. No, they, I think we're pretty they, far off the track though. I mean yeah. what, what is this is all kind of like history that doesn't really have direct relevance. The situation is the school district is in very serious trouble. We so the asked, way to, asked the township committee for a life raft and they declined to give it to us. And so well, we're probably I, gonna have to make cuts. That's I, the situation. I, I, I think we can still talk to them. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think if you, we sit down and talk. I, I, we would love to have your help on this. I mean, if you can oh, compare. Uh, wait, we, we had these talks before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Phil, this you remember Lou, this. Lou, Lou, I, Lou, Lou, when I was on the committee, that, I never ago. talked with you. You never talked with me. So, I, you know. I, and, and we will. I will address that. You and I could have a, you and I would talk personally. Right. And, and I mean, Bob, I respect your opinion on, on what you mm -hmm. say. You do. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I, think, I think we can work on them. I just, I think it has to be. There's no more time. time. This is, I mean, the, the way that these budgets work, I think that we're out of time. I mean, right? Or, no, or not, necessarily. not necessarily. We still have time. We have time with ours, and we ha I may have time. Right, right. 
It's getting well. Time is right. Yeah. So they're getting, not they're they're not set in stone yet, and they yeah. may not be. You know, until you know, May June. Mm -hmm. Oh, we beat this one down. Yep. So, Mrs. Oh, Caramadian, I know that the, the horse has been beaten. But, yes, this one has been beat. <laughs> but I want to make one comment in and fairness. Buried. In fairness to the township committee, yes. uh, the discussions about the Ron property, which later became Cornerstone, oh. happening for years. We, we were not left in the dark about it, but we were we were certainly not part of the decision making process. That was the township's process. They made the decision. So you know, we we were told about it, but we were also told that it's a foregone conclusion. And so we met with them numerous times to ask about what the impact could be mm -hmm. when it comes to the students that would, would be enrolled and mm -hmm. you know how much money they might be receiving and so on and so forth. I mean, we had meetings, we did receive information, but we were not part of the decision-making process and that's not really part of how it works anyway. But still, I, in fairness to the township committee, they didn't leave us in the dark, they shared information with us. But what we said was, we know this is going to have some kind of impact. We just don't know what yet. And then when the units were built and they started um, having families go into the units, that's when we started to actually see the impact. And it was far more than what we originally estimated. And that and that that is what happened. I mean, you, you we couldn't prepare for, let, let's say hypothetically, we said, okay, we're gonna have $100,000 in extra costs. And it was, let's say, between three and four hundred thousand dollars in extra costs. That's a big difference that we didn't necessarily estimate, and you, you just don't always see that coming. And it, and we can't just say, well, it's cornerstone. There are other families that have come into the community where children have needs, and the needs cost a significant amount of money. So it's not just cornerstone. But the point is that that when students have extensive needs, it does cost the district a significant amount. And we're number one, I, I wanna make it clear that this isn't against students. This is not against their families. This is not against anyone. It's just, the, it's just math at this stage where we are spending a tremendous amount on certain out of district placements, for example, which we're exploring other options. Uh, we're looking at different things that we can do to help address that. But at the same time, I mean, the, the, the shortfall that we have that has kind of piled up over the past couple of years that, I mean, it's just hard to keep up with. A district like Delanco cannot absorb that and say, well, you know, we're fine with our budget after receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional costs. So what I would like to say to Mike Templeton is, thank you for that communication over time. I don't want the township committee to be blamed, but at the same time, what I would ask is, would the township committee consider again, helping us because this, this could be the difference between programs and not having programs. This could be the difference between teachers having jobs or not. You know, so this is something that I am making this plea to the township committee that this is a situation that none of us truly created, but I think it's something that we need to work together to resolve. Um, and and I, I know for a fact that the district, if we do it alone, <laughs> it's going to oh, impact on programs, staffing, and other aspects of what we do. I, I know this already. This is something that our district is already discussing over the, the past few months. It's just a matter of what's it going to be, and that will be part of a discussion that the board has. But I would rather not have that discussion. I would rather say, well, we can save some things with the help of the township committee. That's, that's what I'm asking. It's not a demand. It's not disrespect to what you represent. It's we do need help. And that's it, we're a community and, and Joe, you're a, you're a, a thousand percent correct. So the one thing I've seen, I mean, so far in the few, what, the three months is I think physically and the town, the, the um, schools are being run efficiently as, as efficiently as you can under the circumstances that we did exist today. And it's not. It's not like we're going out and building a stadium or something like that for for the for the Thank student. You. Uh, you know, I it's it and that's that's the argument to sit down with those other committee. Uh, you know, with the township committee people, and and show them because they have no idea of what you know what you know the finances and how they're handled with school boards versus township committees and so forth. So, you know, I think, 
again, I think there's there's time. I think we, you know, we can we can work on it, um, you know, hopefully successfully, so that so that we get out of this situation that we're in temporarily. Mm -hmm. So I think having uh, Fern and Kate um, on our side, it, it, you know, is a good start. So um, we just we just have to peel off one or two other people there. <laughs> and I think we, peel the I onion. think we I think we can do that if if we if we you know, sit down in a non-adversarial type of situation. That's that's all I'm <laughs> trying to say. So I'm done. Yes, thank I was you. Know a lot about this. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's I appreciate everyone's <laughs> comments. Too. Obviously it's a very touchy subject with a lot of passion behind it. So hopefully we find um, some great resolutions to get to the other side of it all. So thankfully I left a check mark check mark on my paper where we were last because otherwise I would have forgotten. But we are now Marcia, going to old business. Can I have a couple oh, minutes? Yes, Mike. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I've, li I've listened to this. Uh, I, I, I thank Mr. Dovey for, uh, for uh, uh, taking, taking some arrows there and explaining a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's not us against them. It's not, uh, uh, we're all looking for a better community and a better school system. Um, much uh, as, as Mr. Doby alluded to a couple times and tried to get across, the affordable housing law in New Jersey, um, that's something we're kind of force fed. Um, and when you challenge it or object to it, um, you end up with probably two or three times more housing units and then you end up paying your court costs and the other guy's court costs. So it gets real expensive really fast, but I'll put that aside. Um, as far as, um, you know, I've, I've been actually spending more time looking at your budget and other school district budgets than I have on the municipal budget. Um, and I, trying to educate, uh, as Mr. Doby said, uh, the terminology is different, how things are calculated are different, but I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting a handle on it. But I've been looking at other K through eight districts uh, in the region. And I think you'll find it very illuminating if you look at your financial report and compare that to other districts, K through eight, and their financial reports. They're on the De New Jersey Department of Education website by year. Uh, the interesting thing in those reports, those financial reports are thrown about 130 pages. Uh, in the back section there, they have a, a 10 year look backs. And so you can see how budgets uh, evolve uh, over the last 10 years in those districts and your district. And uh, I think you'll learn a lot. The other thing, uh, again, as Mr. Doby pointed out, your budget, you set the budget that you need to provide a thorough and efficient education. The township sets a budget to provide the municipal services that this community wants. There are two separate things. That chart and the talk of percentages that were low on percentage, were ranked 43rd, that doesn't mean a thing. You have control of what you're, what you're spending and what you need, and that's your side of the seesaw. If you spend, um, you define that tax rate, you define what you need. And uh, I think, um, you know, tossing out numbers like that, that were, it, it's just misleading and it's really disinformation. Um, Mike, I've got a question. It's not thing. disinformation. That's that's a fact. That's everything. We're, I'd, we're I'd like not to be it. interrupted. Okay, thank you. Um, it's it's really disinformation, and it's unfair that listening to three board members uh, perpetuate that. It's, it's kind of unfortunate. Well, but, but Mike, uh, let me, can I just ask a simple leave, question? Leave, I mean, is there? Is I'd there like a to finish my comment without being interrupted. Okay. Um, so I I think. I think the lesson or something that the, the board members can, can uh, if you want to, I think look at, look at the other district budgets, look at those other financial reports and look at your own financial report buried in the back of it. It says, you know, it has a page, a couple of pages describing the uh, tax abatements, the pilots. 
and there's a, in black and white, the pilots have absolutely no impact on your budget, zero. And so that's in your financial statement. And um, I, th I think if you look at those reports that you submit, your district submits, I think you'll find it very illuminating. And when you come, you know, come back to us with that, those facts and that understanding of the relationship between a school district and the municipality and the constraints that you're against and the constraints that we're against, then we can have a conversation. But if there's gonna be I, uh, distortions and innuendo and half truths going back and forth and originating amongst some of you. Can you be specific, Mike? It's not gonna look, if you <laughs> listen to what you've been talking about for the last 20 minutes. No, it might, you're, you're not, not, you're not making the connection. To, as, a, as a resident of Delanco. That's what I have to say. Uh, we have a township committee meeting next Monday night and we have a budget session on the 22nd. So, um, thank you for this, time. this is a small tag just to, you know, because I can't help it. It's, to, to me, the situation is we, um, I mean, you're a member of the township committee. So what I, what I want to do is fund the schools properly without raising taxes. So what I'm asking the township committee to do is to find somewhere to cut your budget. I mean, there should be some kind of mechanism. It should at least be open to the possibility of having that conversation with us. And I, to me, it feels like you're just kicking the can down the road and you know, throwing some, making us feel like we don't, you know, telling us to do our homework and come back, but you're ignoring the, 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 the thing that's playing in front of everybody's face, um, which is that we can, yes, we can raise taxes on the town, but that's not what we want to do. We want to fund the schools without raising taxes if at all possible. So that, that's my comment. Thank you. That's correct. That's where this all started from. This is a tough time. We do not want to raise taxes on the people in this town. People are suffering enough. We were hoping to work with the township to figure out a way to keep taxes as they are. And it seemed to us that the township had some extra money to spend on some vanity projects for the town that could perhaps be better suited for the schools this year. Priority should be the kids. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot, Vince. <laughs> I stand All right, by so my we're, we're gonna now move this on. We're gonna move this to old business. And these should be relatively quick. So A, ethics forms must be signed and returned to the business administrator. B, board member mandatory training for 2021. And C, the deadline for SEC filings is 4 21 Deadline for new board members is 3 21 Please submit them as soon as possible. Is there any new business? Oops, I have something I'd like to bring up. It's um, related to how funds are spent. Um, and I, I just wanna, I wanna give a little background. This is Tamira. Um, it's come to you. Okay. okay. Here, who's asking who's speaking. It's helpful if you identify yourself. Oh, Vera Dharma. It's come to my Thank attention you. that our district belongs to a consortium of Title III funds and the North Hanover School District is the lead agency for the consortium. Title III funds come from the federal government and are used for ESL or for English language learners. In order to use these funds, it's my understanding that students must be screened and tested for ESL following specific regulations, state regulations. My question is, before COVID in 2019, were we in compliance for identifying and screening for ESL? And if we were not in compliance, how could we spend Title III funds? That's my question. This has to do with how we meticulously use any funds. Even if this amount of money is not a big amount of money, I wanna know are we following proper procedures are we being meticulous? That's the root of my question. Okay. So a question that definitely could have been asked via email and they could have re researched it and responded. Unfortunately, at this time, without that pr prior notice, they're not able to provide you that researched information. So I think it's probably better addressed um, after the meeting. Okay, at, at a, another meeting, we could also bring it up. And, I mean, if that, uh, go ahead, Harry. Well, I, 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 
as the head of the committee, we are doing the finances. Now I would say that, yeah, we are uh, in compliance. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And I don't understand what any kind of remedy from 2019 has with our energies going forward. The, the reason I bring up 2019 is because with COVID, the state gave a lot of leeway in reach to testing, state testing. But before COVID, there are specific regulations that Harry, I don't think you're familiar with, that you have to have a teacher, she has to be, he or she has to be qualified to give this as a board test. member as a board member it's not my business it's not that's why i'm that asking the the, the superintendent oh, because that's his business and he would know so harry I, you can't really answer that question I, the superintendent Vera, would have i'm not answer. answering it here i'm not answering it but i am yes, did. you I said am. you thought we were in um, compliance well uh firstly to respond to yeah. what karmanugian said thank you mrs karmanugian and i appreciate your response uh, Ms. Ms. Darmo, uh, I have shared a tremendous amount of information about ESL with the board in recent months. I, I would recommend that you review the information that has already provided in regard to uh, issues and you know challenges that we faced in regard to ESL. The, I, I provided a significant amount of information about that to you. I'm talking about Title III funding. And if we were legally allowed to spend those funds, that was not provided in the email. Okay, well, I appreciate your question. And I, again, I would, I would refer you back to those emails in regard to the compliance topic. That, that's, that's the only comment I have at this time. Vera, just for your information, I, I have been a New Jersey certified principal supervisor for about 30 some years. I have a master's degree in school psychology. I'm also certified in Pennsylvania and in New Mexico. And I have teaching certification in California, New Mexico, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, number, numerous subjects. And I also think I know a little bit, but I don't understand specifically what you're trying to accomplish. Are, we, are you trying to get us more money? Well, the, the oh. question is, if you have federal funding, you have to follow federal, you have to follow regulations in order to use that funding. Um, this is not even a big amount of money I'm talking about. Why My whole point is we have money? to be very meticulous with our money. And this is just one area where I'm not sure we're being meticulous in following well, regulations. So I'm wondering, are there other areas where we're not being meticulous? That's why I'm bringing this up. Well, I think that that at this I point in time is something that should be tabled because as we learned earlier in our training, this is not something to be discussed in this manner. This is something we can discuss out at a different time. So I think moving on, we will now move on from this subject because there's nothing we're going to gain from continuing to discuss this and throw information out on the table that no one is going to answer. So now I'm moving on. So we are now going to see if there's um, information regarding the budget workshop. Let's go. Well, um, so Mrs. Karamanugian, before we get to the budget workshop, we would, we would typically have like a break for the, um, the board members uh, prior to certain things happening. Is it possible for us to have that break for a few minutes? Of course it is. <laughs> okay. I don't, as the presiding I, officer. I'm not a mean person. You may have a break to, to do as you wish. <laughs> All right, I'm only saying that maybe maybe for the sake of everyone that we have a break for just a few minutes before we jump into the budget aspect. Hey, you're being too meticulous now, man. Oops, I took my break a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did see Bob quickly run off and come back, but I'm, yes. I'm I, speaking for myself, but but I'm also <laughs> sympathetic to others. Yes, let's no. give everybody a couple minutes to quickly go take care of whatever's necessary. And I then mean, come, do we have it's to go 831. To Huh? We have to go to a different uh, site. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Just, just, just like okay. we've been on for just a bit now since six because we had the training. So we just want to give everyone a moment prior to going into the information regarding the budget work workshop because okay. after that we're going to yeah. sum this up and then go into an executive session. So it's going to keep on going gotcha. how that goes. Gotcha. So let's take a couple minutes. It's eight thirty-two. So everybody, go do what you got to do. <laughs> Excellent. I believe we have everyone back. And 
the thrill is back. So now we will move on to the budget workshop. <laughs> Vicki, the floor is yours. Have to follow that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to share a screen here. Okay. Okay, do you see the Lanco Township Board of Education? No, we do not. Oh. <laughs> Try to stop sharing my screen. Flower picture. I don't do it. <laughs> Did that do anything? Nope. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. <laughs> <Now, now laughs> like I turned it off. <laughs> How that work? Do we, do we have any advice for Vicki Albert? Any? I, I, when you hit share screen, are you clicking in your entire? Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, oh there it is. There it is. There it is. But are, are you seeing the right one? <laughs> well, Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> it's Delanco Township Board of Education 2021-2022 Budget Workshop with the Dragon. No, okay. excellent. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. Uh, so we're going to talk about the budget presentation overview. We'll talk about uh, some historical information, the revenues and expenditures, how they compare. Um, we'll look at budgeted fund balance, how that impact impacts the budget. Um, also banked cap and the 2021-2022 budget development process that we've gone through so far. So for um, our revenues that we work with are the tax levy, the tuition revenue, miscellaneous revenue, which would include the library lease, uh, interest on deposits. In the past, it would also include um, revenue from like the X care program that we have. We have not been able to run that program due to COVID. So I did not put that back into the budget because we don't even know if we'll be able to start that program up in the fall or not. Um, we'll talk about audited excess surplus. State sources of, of revenue are categorical state aid, extraordinary aid, non-public transportation aid. The federal sources are the IDA basic and preschool. Um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Mersinger pointed that out earlier, but we're not sure if we're even gonna get preschool aid or not. Um, ESEA entitlements, Title I, two, three, and four, that was brought up earlier that we get federal funding. Um, this is just a graph that shows you, it gives you a visual of the, the, the revenues that we get. The tax levy is in the blue. The orange is the categorical state aid. I don't know how well you can see this um, on your screen. Yeah, and that makes up most of the revenue that that comes in and then you'll see the tiny banding at the top is the additional small amount of aid that we get. Expenditures, um, the budget is compiled in accordance with the NJ Department of Education School Finance Uniform Minimum Chart of Accounts. The expenditures can be categorized by the following, um, salaries, benefits, tuition, transportation, other expenses and capital outlay expenses. And to help um, with the cost, the district does um, participate in cooperatives. So um, we are in agreements for the telephone, the power and utilities, the uh, school and office supplies, the cafeteria food supplies, fuel purchases and pro property and workers compensation insurance. Another bar graph that shows the expenses. This blue uh, piece here is the salaries. It's remained constant. Um, we have not had um, an increase due to negotiations yet. Um, the benefits are in the orange. That will not increase next year. 
Um, a lot of districts are finding that they're actually not making out with the new um, educators plan, but we were lucky in that we're staying relatively flat. Um, you'll see tuition has become a greater part of our expenses. This yellow is the facilities and you'll notice that that has gone down over time. It's greatly reduced now, which is concerning. Um, this is the transportation expense that we uh, have for out of district students or for our Riverside students, um, Holy Cross. It's just our, all of our transportation costs are in that. Um, other expenses and the capital outlay. Capital outlay is um, you know, your fixed assets. And this is just a chart to show you for our total expenses, um, extraordinary or categorical state aid covers about this much of it. <laughs> the local tax levy covers this, the local tax levy and the state levy, um, the state aid cover this much. Um, and at this point we have a shortfall in our budget. Budgeted um, fund balance. Vicky, before you move on, I just want to interrupt for a moment. If you can go back to that last slide. Uh, this, this is what we are talking about, is the fact that the funding that we receive from various sources is on one trend line. And you see the expenses are on a trend line that is steeper than that. Uh, that is not something that the district controls. That is something that the district is impacted by over time. So it's just something that, you know, we've been, we were discussing that related to the township aspect of things and whatnot. But I mean, that, that, that to me is, is an important image for everyone to see that funding has not sharply increased uh, as much as the expenses. So, you know, if people want to talk about mismanagement or errors or anything else related to our business office, that is absolutely incorrect. It's that expenses have sharply increased in relation to the funding. So I, I just wanted to make that clear, Vicki. Th thank you. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so um, fund balance is your prior year audited excess surplus. So the 2019-20 school year was just audited. The excess from that will go into the 21-22 budget to reduce the taxes. That impact, um, you'll see that we're bringing in $470,000 from that into this current next year's budget. The current budget that we're working on, just for comparison, had $1.1 million in it. So you'll see um, there was a, a huge shortfall in that, and that is because the tuition and transportation ate up that extra funding that we had in there. Banked cap is um, it's amounts generated in prior budget years when the district either did not go to the 2% increase, like I mentioned before, or they didn't utilize some other kind of adjustment. Sometimes you'll get an enrollment adjustment. If your enrollment goes up a lot, you'll get extra funding for that, where you can tax, you can increase your tax rate for that. Um, we didn't have an enrollment adjustment this year. Um, our banked cap in 1819 was $13,405. We used that already. You can only go back three years for your banked cap, and that's why I'm showing it this way. Um, the 1920 didn't generate any. 2021 um, is generating 65,000. If we want to use that, we would go above the 2%. So this would actually increase it about, it would go to about 3%. And that's the total that we can use for this year. So our anticipated appropriations, um, again, salaries, we're continuing our ne negotiations with the DTA. Um, the insurance, there's only gonna be a slight increase. Like I said, it's remaining relatively flat for the health insurance. Dental, I'm estimating a 1% increase for our dental expenses. Um, workers comp property casualty just came in today. It's a 3% increase increase. I did not get that into the budget numbers that I'm presenting, but I know it's a 3% increase. Um, the PERS appropriation is um, our portion of, it's the public employee retirement system. It's our portion of the funding for that. And we're keeping that flat at 82,000 like we had to pay this year. 
um, transportation, we have an increase of approximately $100,000 in the budget. And tuition, we have an increase of approximately 500,000. And that number should not surprise you because you've seen the agendas throughout every month where we have additional tuition placements in there. Um, and then nursing services, we're increasing that about 90,000. Um, and, and we will go out for RFP to try to, to minimize at least the nursing services, but there's not a lot that we can do about the tuition and the transportation. Um, so the district began the budget process approximately $800,000 over budget after all the department and building requests were considered. We whittled it down. We took out anything that we absolutely did not need. Um, and it's been adjusted down by approximately $370,000. So we still have another 422,000 to go. Um, the items that have been reduced include tuition allocations, substitute allocations, supplies, benefit allocations, security upgrades, facilities upgrades, technology upgrades, overhead costs, administrative allocations. We are really at the bare bones at this point. And right now there's a 2% levy um, included in, in the numbers. Um, I mentioned we could go to 3%. I did not include that in here. So that could reduce that $422,000 deficit. Um, and so this is where we stand. Uh, you'll see this um, column is the 2021-22 proposed budget. So the tax levy, um, the increase of 2%, sorry, the increase of 2%, will only give us an additional $129,000 to, to, um, to use. The state aid came in a little higher. Those numbers came out last week. Um, so that's at 2.7 million, which is an increase of 84,000. Now that increase is actually, um, it's actually higher. If you remember back in August, the state took $115,000 back due to COVID. So, that 115 is still in this 2021 budget number. So the 84,000 is a little bit higher, but this um, 2.7 million is what we're getting. Extraordinary aid, we uh, keep that flat because you're just not sure if you're gonna get it. So um, we don't wanna budget for higher and then not receive that because we'd be in a worse shape than we are. Um, library rental uh, in that contract, we are in negotiations right now, but that's going to remain flat for the time being because I don't we don't have a new contract. Uh, that's their annual rental fee. Um, the miscellaneous revenue, you'll see this huge jump here of 235,000. Um, that's the ESSER funds that the state just gave us. And those are less restricted than the other CARES funds that we had gotten in the past. Um, you don't, it's not subject to supplant versus supplement. So I just put it in as a miscellaneous revenue item here. Um, that budgeted fund balance, like I mentioned, is uh, 470,000, that's there. So that gives us our total, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong screen. So that gives us our total revenue, I don't know, I, okay, of um, 10.1. And then uh, at the bottom, you'll see what our expenditures are budgeted at. So the 3.7 for the proposed salaries, you'll see there's a negative there, uh, it's a reduction in salaries. That's due to one retirement for next year that we know of already. And I was kind of putting in some um, staffing changes, some, some experimental items that we're gonna talk about in an executive session because we know there's it's, it's going to impact staff. So um, I put some of that in there. The benefits, again, would be reduced if the staffing is reduced. Tuition, um, it has a slight increase here uh, over the last year, transportation, capital outlay, um, and there's our deficit right now is that 422,000. Vicki, I'm sorry, Can you, yes. would you mind going back to that slide real quick? Yeah. I wasn't in town in between 2020 and 2021, or 2019, 20, 2021. What is the $72,000 increase in salaries from, do you remember? I know that was a while ago, or were you- Wait, say that again, which, what are you looking the at? The salaries um, expenditures line. 
salary expenditures. Uh, yeah. 1920 to 2021, there's like a 70, 70 $2,000 increase year over year. Did something major happen that year? Well, you do put in, um, you do budget for salary increases even if you don't have a new contract. So that's that's probably what that's for. We also had hired um, a maintenance supervisor that might be part of it. Um, we also had moved, uh, we did a little bit of shifting in the supervisory positions. Um, so that that's part of that number as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, the strategies now that we're going to look at to close the remaining gap would be to use the, the banked cap of 65,000. Um, we've been discussing open up an MD program to bring students back in district instead of paying out of district tuition plus the transportation costs. We're looking into preschool expansion aid, um, outsourcing some, some staffing that we have. Um, facility usage and rental fees, renegotiating some contracts for those, reductions in travel, which are already at the bare minimum, um, supply reductions, which are already at the bare minimum, um, and personnel considerations. Uh, Vicki, quick question. What did MD stand for on that slide? Open up um, an MD multiple, program. Multiple disabled. At it. Thank you. Just um, and also just to clarify on that, uh, an MD program is one consideration. It could be a autism program. It could be MD. It could be any number of things that relate to different special needs. So uh, MD is just kind of a placeholder for a, a self-contained in-district special education program. Thank you. There's a comment. Outsourcing. You're talking about things like proximity learning. Is she fast? I can't hear her. Uh, Barry, can no, you? No, muffle, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, wait. I had a I had to put on my headset. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, because my daughter went to sleep. So, um, outsourcing. You're talking about the online teachers that would maybe be teaching Spanish and ESL, correct? What is the outsourcing? What are you talking about with outsourcing? I think if we're talking about outsourcing staff in any way, I think that we would reserve that for a confidential discussion rather than a public discussion. Uh, but just to clarify, um, ESL, we approved a substitute last month. And for Spanish, uh, we're still exploring different options, uh, neither of which uh, are outsourcing at this time. So right now, the term outsourcing, we're not discussing. I would, I would recommend that we not if it relates to personnel. I mean, personnel is, is a typically a confidential topic. Please continue. Does anybody have any other questions for this? And I... Vicki, it's uh, Vince. Uh, from the last slide, the, the recommendations you're making, like, I, I, you know, I think you know this too, like from, you know, considering all these cuts, I mean, I, 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 I'm just taking a rough figure, but I imagine I'd maybe come up with 100,000 altogether with those cuts alone, you know, am I about correct on that? Or how much, if we, let's say we, I know potentially let's, let's forget the MD program. It may take a year to establish right. or, or more, right? It's not something we can implement very quickly, I imagine. But from the cuts that we're talking about, how much could this take off approximately? I mean, there'll be a significant amount left over is what I'm trying to get at. We, we, we will be left with a significant amount. Yes. Um, I have another comment or actually a question. I think um, in addition to bringing some category of special ed possibly back into the district, are we looking at districts that are closer, nearer to us to um, possibly put placements in those districts to districts that also have very high quality programs, but the transportation costs might not be as much. Do you know what I'm saying? I do, absolutely. And we do consider that uh, just so that the board is aware and members of the public are aware. The first consideration is always what meets the needs of the child. So we can't necessarily look and say, well, which district is closer and 
you know, transportation as a first consideration. We don't look at it that way. Say what meets the needs of the child and then consider other, other aspects of the different programs. But yes, I mean, let's say there's a program that's 30 miles away and another one that's three miles away and they both meet the needs of the child, it would certainly make more sense for us to say, well, let's consider the one that's much closer uh, for various reasons. But for the, you know, for the sake of the child's bus ride, for the sake of transportation, for, for all sorts of things. And, and, but still, that's not the number one consideration. The number one always is what, what are the needs of the child? Uh, Joe, can you hear me? Yes. Can I be heard? I can oh, yes. hear you. Yeah. Um, my understanding is the IEP. The IEP calls for specific, you know, um, training, you know, education and the other services. So that's directed by the IEP, correct? Yes. So the IEP is a document that functions in many different ways, including outlining the needs of the child. Yeah. And then the parent has, if the child's going to be placed out of district, once it's no longer the least restrictive environment, the home district, that in fact, then they get to choose which they think is the most appropriate facility for their child. Well, what I, what I would say about parent involvement in that is that instead of the parent choosing that it's a combined collaborative effort between the yeah. child study team and the parent where, uh, and in, you know, this is just something that happens in every district that the child study team might sometimes recommend something that the parent disagrees with or yeah. vice versa. And that requires discussion. Uh, sometimes, you know, in, in ex more extreme cases, it requires requires steps, uh, legal steps to be taken and so on, uh, the, the due process that's required. So it is a collaborative effort because what we want is we want the best placement for the child and we want the parent to also feel secure and confident that the child's needs are being met. It's, so it's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, is it possible to cut um, busing for kids in town or what? Or okay, tell me, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that, Ricky? Or, and Joe, both of you. So travel reductions, I believe Vicki put that on there based on the fact that if we were to set up a, a program in district that that would reduce uh, transportation. Yes, okay. Gotcha. But, but I also think that if we talk about travel reductions though, that, that that's a separate matter when it comes to board members or staff members traveling for training, that kind of thing. So there's, you know, there's transportation reductions, which they're not specifically listed, but she had mentioned it under the you know, adding of the program. But travel is more like, you know, like if we're going to go to Atlantic City for the, the conference, I see. Uh, the, the board decided one year we're not, we're not going to do that to save funding for the district or, you know, staff traveling to different conferences and whatnot. We've we've reduced that as well. Uh, you know, I just I wanted to put both in there because the transportation students is not listed, but that, that would also be reduced under certain uh, in programs that we could bring in, so. Um, yeah, I guess it just to follow up, is that, well, <laughs> is there any fat we can cut in the, in the transportation at the moment? Um, I imagine, it's okay if the answer is no. I, um, but are, you know, are we going above and beyond on, on the busing in any way? That has uh, been explored. I, yeah, go ahead, Vicki, go ahead, sure. I mean, that has been explored in the past, but there are mm -hmm. certain routes that are hazardous that you have to bus the students for, and there are students that live outside the, that range that you have to bus them for. Okay. I know, and this is kind of a finance committee issue. I just wanted to ask, I just wanted to see if there was, what kind of wiggle room there was. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vicki. That was a very thorough presentation. Yeah, sure. Vicki. The word evaded me for one second. <laughs> it was a presentation, it literally was because private time. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs>
like my brain was slow to have it come out of my mouth. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I'm assuming the distributions are out because they were all sent out virtually at this point in time. So there's nothing further that would need to go out. Um, so now we're going to just move forward on to public comment on non-agenda items. And we did receive, I have it, I had to pull it up on my, my phone so I could see it. Um, the online comment form. Fortunately, because Mr. Airy was present, he was able to answer, I feel, two of the three questions or two to three comments that were made. But I'll just quickly touch on them just so that um, we are sure that they were for like covered completely. So Mr. Bartlett had mentioned, why are we having internet connectivity issues every week? This has been ongoing since the students started virtual learning in the 2019, 2020 school year or perhaps longer. Who is the district's internet provider? And separately, how does someone renew the, the district's domain name, delango.com, so it expires and leaves the district without a website and email communication? And why was it only renewed for two years now? Who is managing IT for the district and who is evaluating his or her effectiveness given that these two basic things have either failed or continue to fail? Oh my gosh. And then let me go back because I hit a button. Do this. I'm sorry, people. Um, Okay, and then let's see, Mrs. Johnson had mentioned why is the internet connectivity continue to be an issue since virtual learning took place? What are the steps being taken to ensure it is off? I'm hoping that both were present for Mr. Aries' um, presentation and explanation as to why these issues recently have occurred, what they've been doing tirelessly throughout the school year to help resolve them and that they are working day in and day out to help avoid them when they can. So unfortunately at times some things are just unavoidable but they're doing their very best. So I'm hopeful that those questions were addressed and were answered and and the video of this meeting will be available uh, afterwards. So if you missed Mr. Aries' explanation you can go back and then I encourage that. Thank you, Stephen. I completely forgot about it. That's very true. Um, and then Mrs. Foley wanted to, to let us know. She said, dear members of the Board of Education, thank you for your time and service on the board. I would like to comment on the Read Across America activities that took place last week at Pearson. So extremely well done and thought out. Each day of the week had a book and spirit wear theme. My daughter had a blast and really got into it. As a family, we enjoyed searching through books at home to find and read a book on the theme each night. Also, a few weeks ago, the school celebrated the 99th day of school. Again, there were so many optional and fun activities to go along with the day. In my opinion, children learn the best when they are engaged and having fun, even if that means dressing up like a 99-year-old lady when you are five. Despite all that is going on and the staff being overworked, I truly appreciate them constantly going above and beyond and providing the child with these fun and special opportunities and memories. Thank you. Sincerely, Danielle Foley. That was wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then I'll open this up to anybody else that might have a uh, public comment on a non-agenda item. Um, can I, I, it's Allie Donnelly. I was just, I don't know if I'm allowed to call. I, this is on, this is just about the budget. We just had a question, a question. I had a question mm -hmm. um, because the new administration, like the new administration in Washington just came out with this new COVID relief bill. Um, obviously a lot of us just saw it and they're probably excited about maybe another stimulus check, but um, it's the understanding that the districts are getting, the districts, each district is going to be getting a, lot, a sum of money um, for, for K to, well, we're K to eight, but for all K to 12 districts are getting a lump sum of money. Is this something that was already put in the budget for 21, 22, or is this just an additional, something that will be additional um, for next year? Was it put in there? I know it came out today, but I was I, like, it was under, I was under the understanding that most districts knew what kind of type of money they were getting. I just was, just so if it's that. the ESSER funds, then that is included. That was in the um, miscellaneous revenue line that I added it in. But so it was, that was 285000 I thought it, it was, uh, oh, okay. All right. I, if there's would, more funding that came out today that they didn't tell us about, then that wouldn't be in there. But I, I okay. didn't receive any communication on that. I don't, okay. um, I don't think it was included. Um, they're calling this, I think, the American 
rescue plan. Yeah. Which is a separate uh, initiative now. So, and, and it did just suddenly arrive today, the news right. about it. So I don't, I don't know that it's been accounted for. I just know that it, they do talk about Title I. They talk about different aspects of the funding that we already received. But, mm -hmm. And that has been accounted for, funding that we're you know, fully aware of. This, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just coming today, uh, th there is a chance that we could receive some additional funding, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just we're, it's unknown to us right now. Okay. Bern, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, something that uh, triggered in my mind when you were going through uh, the agenda was, uh, I think it was P7510, use of uh, the school buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be appropriate for uh, recreation to submit, uh, I guess, to be able to use the school for the summer program? I know they're putting their, together their plan uh, uh, for the summer and I guess looking uh, at the, their fall programs with volleyball, et cetera. And I know COVID has played a major uh, restriction, but uh, when I saw that on there, I thought, well, is it appropriate for them to submit a request? They, they actually have submitted a request, uh, which at this time, you know, I, it's unfortunate, but at this time I've given a response of a conditional no, uh, simply because of various factors, including COVID-19. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's a definite no, but it's, you know, we did receive that request uh, and it's, uh, there are many considerations in place when it comes to the usage of the building in the summer. Okay. Uh, may I ask uh, who requested permission to use the, uh, the facilities? It was Aaron Provenzano through the, uh, the um, Recreation Commission. Oh, okay, through recreation, but this uh, particular request that's on the uh, was approved tonight from the agenda. Does that uh, is that for someone special or? It's uh, not a request. It's a policy. Okay. There are policies and regulations that were approved, but not not a request. Okay. Thank you. Well. Is there anybody else? I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Well, then I will close the public comment section on a non-agenda item. Well, Mrs. Karamanugian, before you do, I just want to go back to one item. I, I want to thank uh, Jennifer Crozier for organizing Read Across America, as well as Mr. Conti working in conjunction. Uh, so I appreciate Mrs. Foley's comment, and I appreciate Jennifer Crozier and Mr. Conti for teaming up and, and working on that with all the teachers uh, as well to, to have a good experience for our students. So I, I do appreciate that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close it now. It's closed. So now we're going to just need a motion to go into an executive session um, to discuss budgetary items related to personnel. I'll make the motion, Cameron. Thank you, Kevin. Second, Steve. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody have questions or comments in regards to this? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Anyone abstain? And um, it's for personnel. So um, we'll be going into that separate Zoom link. It is currently 9.13. How long do you think that we will be um, discussing this important matter, Joe? I mean, I would say it could be up to an hour uh, to, to go through various uh, details or, or even even summaries, you know, but no matter what, it would, it's going to take a significant amount of time to just go through different uh, ideas that, that could be on the table. Okay, so looking to come back at approximately 1015, but obviously these things are not accurate ever, so be prepared. Okay, so let's leave here and go on to the other link, please. Thank you. But, um, all right, I'm going to make the motion. I asked for the motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved, Stephen. Okay, I was like, oh my God, Stephen, I just came <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, who would second that? I'll second. I'll second. All right, thank you. Good Wait, night. Who was that? Who was second? Oh, Stephen, and then it was, um, 
Vince. Uh, Vince. That's fine. It was Phil. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Thank we'll thank say you. Phil. I heard his Phil voice closed it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. I appreciate all the time and effort everyone put in. Thank you. Thank good you. Night all. Have a good night. Morning.